I'd like to call this special meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District to order. And I'd also like to apologize to everyone who had to wait out in the cold for the power to come on, but it was beyond our control to do anything about that, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, we're still here and let's, let's get moving. Will uh, Secretary call the roll? President Hill. Here. Vice President Ackerman. Here. Director Foltz. Here. Director Smalley. Here, and there's no one in the room with me. Thank you. Okay. Changes to the agenda. Changes to the agenda, if any, may be made in accordance with California Government Code 54954.2, Ralph M. Brown Act, which includes but is not limited to additions for which the need to take action is declared to have risen after the agenda was posted as determined by a two-thirds vote of the Board of Directors, or if less than two-thirds of the members are present, the unanimous vote of those members present. Uh, Mr. Frost, are there any changes to the agenda from staff? No changes. Thank you, President. Okay. Anyone else have any changes to the agenda? No. Seeing none, no changes. Oral communication. This portion of the agenda is reserved for oral communications by the public on any subject that lies within the jurisdiction of the district and is not on the agenda. Any person may address the board of directors at this time. Normally, presentations must not exceed three minutes in length, and individuals may only speak once. Please understand that the Brown Act limits what the board can do regarding issues not on the agenda. No action or discussion may occur on issues outside of those already listed on today's agenda. Any director may request that a matter raised during oral communication be placed on a future agenda. Do we have any oral communications from the public? Anything online? I seeing none and seeing none online. We'll move on to Unfinished business. Item A, vacancy of elective office of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Mr. Frost, do you want to present that? Sure. Thank you, President. Um, I just wanted to give a brief overview of um, the process. This is, of course, to review the applicants, um, both their written submittals and also to interview the applicants. And if you so decide to select one, to appoint them to fill the term, uh, remaining term of um, left by Gail Mason in the resignation. So essentially, just a couple of guidelines is we interview and ask the questions that you do try to ask the same questions to each of the applicants. I believe we have one attending online. I believe Alina Lang's online, if we can promote her. Um, and then after there will be, of course, there's public comment, the same as any other, mm -hmm. and then also for discussion on each of the applicants as you see. Good. And then of course, if you so decide to, you can read the motion um, to appoint one of those mm -hmm. for the vote. So we'll leave it at that, but thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have Ms. Lang on the... Uh... She's not a panelist at this point. She's an attendee. I'm just asked CTV to promote her. Okay. If we wait just a moment while that happens, I want her to be able to hear and see everything. Uh, she's been promoted. I'm here. Hello. Hi. Okay, so we have four applicants. We have Elena Lang. Karen Brown, Michael Duffy, and Brian Largue. And I think I'll just take these in alphabetical order, which makes Karen Brown first. And I think all the board members have reviewed the resume already. Is that uh, true? You, you, Bob, you, re you reviewed her resume? <laughs> Mark, have you, you've reviewed the resume, haven't you? Okay. I've, I've reviewed everything in the agenda packet. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, question. Oh, good question. 
uh, with this fan on, it's an ambient uh, noise, and I really can't hear correct. Okay. The dialogue. I've, I'm sensitive to that. I have hard of hearing too. Is that fan in the washer in the doorway out there? I mean, I turn it off, but it's going to get hot in here. Well, that's that 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 evening. That uh, no, turn it off. You need to turn it low or something. Yeah. It's on low. Oh. Yeah. Turn. Just turn it off. I mean, the, the sun's going down. It, it won't get real hot. If it does, we'll turn it back on. So, Karen, would you like to introduce yourself, take about two minutes, and just give us a quick rundown on... Uh, um, yes, dear board members, my name is Karen Brown. I live north of Boulder Creek. I have lived in the same house for 46 years now. I moved in in 1978. I lived through the storm of 1982, the earthquake of 1989, and every disaster that this valley has endured. My family was in charge of a private water system. And when SLVWD took over my system, I have done all I can to watch the fiduciary use of my money. In 2014, I ran for the SLVWD Board of Directors. I have been given the full tour of the district, Lion and Felton treatment plants. I know how the system works. I know the conveyance of water to the treatment plants, to the stores, to the delivery of the water for our ratepayers. I know that there are storage tanks that have to be looked at, I have hiked to see them and taken photos. And when their project comes up for review, I drive to see the location. And then I hike in if needed and watch the board meetings on the community TV from either my laptop or my television. I have many transferable skills. I was a quality control inspector and I can check documents, I can notice problems. I read all the documentations in the board packet. I take notes. I bring questions to the meeting. As an emergency response personnel, I have been trained in the procedures of the fire department and can recognize a medical emergency. I know protocol and hazmat removal procedures. From the computer, I can make graphs and charts. I have a presence in this valley of 610 viewers on Nextdoor, also a Facebook page. I am currently a director for my road association, which is left over after the water association got put into SLBWD. And I'm currently preparing for our yearly meeting with photos and information for the residents and the billing and tracking down all the deadbeats. I've had the unique experience of being out there in the public for the past four months and talk to them and listen to their needs and their needs for clean water at a fair rate. I am also a go-getter and have time to give to the district. I would be proud to serve our ratepayers. I have no political goals or club memberships to influence me. This board needs me. I am one of the ratepayers who is concerned for the future of our water and that the resources are managed now and for the future of SLBWD. Thank you. Okay, so procedurally here, um, if I look at our list here, it says I have the applicants introduce themselves and then interview applicants ensuring that each one is asked the same prepared questions. So since I'd, I'd like to do this where you know, introduce yourself and then we'll ask you questions and then we'll go to the next person, introduce, they can introduce themselves and we'll ask them questions, et cetera. Does that work for That's you? That's very acceptable. Thank you. So um, if we can try and keep the questions down to uh, maybe two minutes, uh, we've got four candidates and five board members and uh, a lot of questions to ask. So Jamie. Sure. Thank you for your application and thanks to all of the applicants. I really appreciate everyone's interest in participating in the water district um, and these important decisions. So thank you for being here. Um, and you are always here. I appreciate that about you. You follow the meetings. 
I noticed you mentioned that your family was involved with running a, a water association. Can you tell me what your role was in that? In that role, I was the uh, billing and secretarial, and my husband did all the maintenance and the plumbing and the piping, and I was also out there hand digging pipes to replace them during the storm of 1982. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and we often have uh, vacancies on our board committees. Um, I noticed that you often come to the board meetings. Have you ever been involved with any of our committees? Um, I did well in the past. I was on one of the committees and I have recently attended the finance committee. And I'm open to attend the committees. That is a responsibility of a board member. I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you had to put your finger on one subject that's the most important subject facing this board at this time, what would you say that is? That we continue to have our meetings twice a month. That we discontinue this once a month meeting. Okay. Did you have a, could you elaborate on that a little? And the reason I feel that we need more meetings twice a month as we were doing them is to address these issues that are on a time-based problem. We need to timely either approve or disapprove projects. And we can't do that only once a month. Thank you. Bob, did you? Sure. Um, you know, a, a few years back, there was an issue that came before this board regarding a potential merger between Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley. Um, typically, with, it, it didn't go anywhere, but typically with these things, they don't go away. They just go underground waiting for different boards. Um, what's your view about that? I have read the master plan, and I understand it was called inner tie number one. And inner tie number one is, um, I don't think it's, we need to include Scotts Valley any more than Scotts Valley is already included into our water district. So you wouldn't be in favor of a, of a merger? Of no, I would yet. not. I want to keep our water in our valley for our rate payers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Mark? Yes. Um, the district is a member of the Santa Clara or the Santa Margarita Groundwater Association agency. And uh, two of the district's board members also serve on the Santa Margarita board. Um, Karen, what's your knowledge of the this agency, the Santa Margarita one? <laughs> and what they do. Um, what they're doing is they're going in and keeping monitoring how many people are grabbing water out of the aquifer. And uh, Santa, Scotts Valley is involved in it. We are involved in it. And I'm sure Lapco's involved in it. And that's basically what I know about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and we'll move on to the next candidate then. Thank you. Uh, the next candidate alphabetically is Michael Duffy. Please tell us about yourself for a couple of minutes, including why you'd like to be a board member. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Mike Duffy. So uh, I am a forester. Uh, a registered professional forester here in Sandwich Mountains. Been doing that for 20 years. I'm a Felton resident as of 2017, uh, raising my two kids here in the Valley. And primarily, yes, I'm a husband and father first. And that's really what I'd like to bring moving forward is kind of more of a, of a focus on working families in the Valley and how we're struggling um, and moving forward with our infrastructure concepts rather than uh, kind of continuing the status quo. Uh, so as a forester, uh, I was heavily impacted with CZ Fire, as I understand. So it was the uh, Valley Water District properties. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned a lot of lessons and we're uh, utilizing new processes, grants, fuel treatments, other things moving forward 
recognizing that the previous ways that we manage properties no longer suffice with the current mm -hmm. ecosystem, with the current climate that we're facing, and would like to bring those forward and encourage those same activities with the property uh, underneath the jurisdiction of the water district. Um, so primarily that's my focus. What I bring is more guidance towards land management. Uh, certainly have done water lines, water storage, uh, you know, basic properties of, 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 of land management in that matter, but uh, primarily larger scale management of properties and, and reduction of fuels is really what I like to look forward. So Thank you. All. Jamie, would you like to? Sure. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, so I uh, appreciate your application and the interesting background that you bring to the issue. Um, I'm trying to keep my questions for each applicant kind of similar. So if you could tell me a little bit more about um, how you think your background in forest management will um, influence your ability to set policy as a board member and sort of what do you see as the role of a board member on a, on a water board? Yes, certainly. Uh, so I, I have some on a board member. So I am familiar with board processes, uh, whether it was through trade organizations or other boards. So I, I, I'm familiar with the process. I do understand that the board is generally providing guidance for the water district and understanding through budgets. Through my own business, or through my own occupation, I do run an office. I do budgets. I do the financials of all of our projects. So I do understand that very well. Also understanding that needing guidance, the, the district itself needs guidance from the board as far as where they're focused, where they're spending money. So, and familiar with that as well. Um, my focus though, uh, the way I look at it and the lesson that I've learned from CZU is that we made a mistake and our ability, our, our, our losses from that fire, um, we can take as a mistake, but if we do it again, that's, that's not a mistake. That's that's a that that's that's tragic on our part, and all the infrastructure that the district lost, that was that was avoidable, and in the same sense, all the infrastructure that we lost on the properties I managed, we didn't recognize the, that it was avoidable, but it was, and so forward thinking and preparing for the the inevitable catastrophic fires allows us to strengthen and to protect those resources. And again, that's that's how my background would be forward is trying to promote and encourage the type of activities that would be protecting the infrastructure for the district to continue to provide clean water. And that's not just water lines, that's not just tanks, that's not just filtration, but it's also the landscape as a whole functioning as the watershed that's gathering the water, that's filtering the water, and it's maintaining the ecosystem as a whole. And there's no reason why the district should not be the exemplary model for our region in providing a solid, sound, functioning ecosystem that is also providing clear water and a safe fuel load that's not going to put our communities at risk. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And also, um, you mentioned uh, that you've been in the community since 2017. Have you had an opportunity to be involved with any of our committees? Uh, I have not, because I have two children. I spent a lot of time with those children. But it is time to get into more into. So I guess before my children, I was much more active in a lot of other things, but I had time was living in Santa Cruz proper. So moved here, and my children are 13 and 10. They're starting to be doing their own things. And so I have a few nights free a week. We would love to participate. Thank you. Um, if you had to pick one item that's facing the board in the next year, let's say, what would you say is the most important thing that the board needs to focus on in the immediate future here? I think the, the board focusing on providing guidance towards the district for hiring and maintaining their staff. Staffing levels are extremely difficult everywhere. And the affordability of our region is abysmal. It's really difficult for working people to stay here and to afford to buy here. It's hard to recruit people 
to come work here, it's difficult. And so I guess if the board has the ability to somehow create a framework and a, a level of, of, of financial backing to help support working families being able to actually come here and live, that's the primary thing. And, and, and I'd like to make that clear, it's not just for the water board, it's everywhere. But I understand and I've seen that a lot of staff has left. You know, a lot of, and, and that's that's not that's that's attrition, that's natural. But finding people to fill that gap is extremely difficult. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, thank you for giving us all that background. I had the same question for you regarding a potential merger between San Lorenzo Valley and Scotts Valley water districts. Where would you fall on that? Okay. So it's difficult to share water. And I have firm belief that water should be the guiding factor when you're discussing development. And any growth should be water-based rather than some other arbitrary mechanism, right? We can only exist as much as we can, drink as much as we can, grow our crops, and that's it, right? So the devil's always in the details. Currently, it's difficult to believe with the current power balance that the valley would end up on the right side of that partnership. Now, it's possible that some deal could be made. And that might make you accept it. But you'd have to really weigh that tightly because these things are long lasting. And what might seem great up front certainly could have long term impacts that were unforeseen. So, look, I'm, I'm open for any type of discussion and any type of long term thing that may work for everybody. But that's a tough one. That's a tough detail. A lot of power differential between Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? Yes, uh, Mr. Duffy, the same question that I've asked about the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. What's your uh, awareness of the agency and what they do locally? Uh, yeah, so. Primarily, my understanding is the association with the aquifers, mostly the east side of the valley, Scotts Valley, uh, and yet yeah, trying to maintain the, the water levels within the aquifers. And it's uh, that's that's kind of about it with the under, with with the outline notion and why it's so important is you run your aquifers dry in the gap, so that. That's a concern. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll move on now to the next candidate. Thank you very much. Okay. And the next candidate alphabetically by last name is Brian Largay. Um, yes, please. Sure, thank you. Introduce yourself. Take a couple minutes to get us to know you, and then we'll ask questions. Wonderful. Uh, members of the board, thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, address you this evening, and the opportunity to put my name forward as a, uh, a potential replacement uh, during this interim period. Uh, I'm Brian Margay. I um, have lived in the Valley for 24 years, raised my family here um, through the SLB High School. And um, they're coming home for the summer, which makes me very happy. Uh, the um, two, two kids. The, um, uh, my wife teaches at SLE and uh, Boulder Creek Elementary in science, K3 science. Um, I have a uh, graduate degree in hydrology. Uh, I, my graduate uh, studies focused on the interaction of surface water and groundwater and a sandy aquifer and uh, the water quality implications of land management and uh, proximity to the aquifer. Uh, I've worked in uh, for special districts, uh, nonprofits, and um, uh, uh, consulting firms in water resources, watershed management, wetland restoration, um, and groundwater studies for 25 years. Um, I worked at the resource, all in the Monterey Bay area. Uh, my first work was in 
for the resource conservation districts of Santa Cruz County and Monterey County, where I was the design hydrologist on a number of uh, practice uh, projects in support of uh, a staff engineer of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We did um, water quality management practices on strawberry and vegetable farms in uh, Watsonville and Salinas. Uh, then I worked at the Elkhorn Slough National Estuary Research Reserve on large-scale wetland restoration projects and collaborative planning processes, science-based planning. Um, and uh, then for the past 12 years, I've been the conservation director at the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, where I've um, run the stewardship department. We're responsible for uh, 19,000 acres of land in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And um, uh, I've done a lot of ecosystem restoration projects, working lands management projects, um, access to nature projects. Uh, <laughs> Uh, along the way, I've served on a variety of committees and, and uh, other professional uh, service opportunities. Um, I'm on the board of the um, St. Lawrence Valley Foundation for Education, where I'm the vice chair. Uh, and um, uh, the land trust has a board that governs it, so I'm very familiar with board procedures and um, Robert's rules and things like that. Um, and uh, I am uh, dedicated professionally to water because water is life and um, they're an honor to serve in the sustainability of our water resources ecologically, um, financially, and um, culturally as we all depend on it. Thank you. Jamie? So thank you so much for being here, Brian. And um, I think good to meet you in person. I know we have connected before, um, but um, I, I think that your resume um, certainly indicates your background um, and, and expertise on this topic. So I guess what I would like to ask you is, um, where do you think that your, your past work, um, either with the Land Trust or the Water Commission, might put you a little bit at odds with um, roles, uh, policy positions that you may need to take as a uh, board member here? <laughs> Um, that's an interesting question. I, um, I, I feel confident that in service as a board member, my primary responsibility would be uh, to the board uh, uh, as a fiduciary of sorts. The um, commission, the, I serve on the County Water Commission, uh, other uh, employees and uh, I think board members of, of other water agencies serve on that commission and aware uh, as and the practices that I would follow is if there's a potential for a conflict of interest, I would disclose that and I would make clear that my uh, uh, obligation is to serve the district on which I'm a board member. Um, so uh, that would uh, surely come up on occasion, but I think it could be navigated effectively. Thank you. And I will ask you the same question I've asked others. Um, have you been involved with our committees? And in particular, um, have you uh, been involved with the Santa Margarita um, Groundwater Management Agency? Uh, so I served on the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, for the SLV Water District in 2014 and um, helped lead the um, process of getting certified. Uh, there was a certification in um, transparency uh, that we sought as a result of that uh, committee's recommendations. Uh, with regard to Santa Margarita, I've attended just a number of the meetings during, during the early um, data collection and policy formation <coughs> period. So that was a few years ago um, and uh, found that to be a, a very interesting process. Um, uh, I have not um, attended for the past couple of years. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, Brian, um, as I've asked the others, what if you had to put your finger on the most important issue that this board has to deal with in the next year or two uh, going forward, uh, what do you think we should be focused on? I think the greatest challenges that we face are related to our infrastructure and the uh, uh, cost and urgency associated with uh, repairing, upgrading, and, and uh, rehabilitating those facilities. I think that um, we have been badly hit by the fires 
I think there that uh, uh, compound and the storms that have washed up out and uh, all of that compound deferred maintenance that had accumulated over a couple of decades and we were just getting momentum in addressing. Uh, and it's uh, really quite frustrating. I think that there's enormous opportunity to tap uh, grant funds and um, FEMA funds. I think that there are, uh, uh, in context, I've uh, written about $25 million in grants uh, and been the lead technical advisor for another $25 million in grants over the years and the um, and had about an 89% success rate in those. Um, so uh, I think that one of the core strategies should be leveraging the opportunity for state and federal funding or, or, or compensation on uh, to address that infrastructure. There's a lot of money out there. One of the challenges is that it takes money to get that money. Specifically, it takes staff who can dedicate the time to write the grants, to get the technical information all organized. Um, and it's not simply grant writing, it's uh, generating shovel-ready projects that are ready to roll. Thank you. Well. Uh, yes, Brian, um, just uh, good to see you again. I know you applied for this position back in 2019, I think it was. So I'm glad you're still with it and wanting to uh, apply again. I wanted to ask the same question about your thoughts on uh, a the merger that was proposed between Scotts Valley Water District and San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Uh, you know, when you look at the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, and the rainfall intensity maps of how many inches of rain we get in a year, at 60 in Boulder Creek, it's uh, about 30 in uh, Santa Cruz, 20 in Watsonville, 15 in San Jose. And if you look at that on a map, it looks like a bullseye. And of course, everyone around us would love to get the water that we have in abundance here. And um, I feel very uncomfortable at the prospect of giving up our water. That said, I also recognize that uh, our communities are under enormous financial strain to maintain the infrastructure that we have, which is so frequently damaged by natural disasters. And uh, it will always be uh, a, 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 an important prospect to explore as to whether we can leverage the financial capacity of places to offset some of our costs and reduce the rates that ratepayers are subject to. Whether a merger with Scotts Valley would adequately address that, I do not know. There seems to be this history of power imbalance reflected in some of the stuff that happened at Santa Margarita where the valley doesn't get uh, a, a, a fair shape. I don't quite understand that. We have more rate payers than, than they do. We have more population. So from a proportionality perspective, I'm a little confused at, as to why um, that shakes out. So there's a ton of devils in the details. Uh, my initial reaction is strong aversion and it would be uh, no thank you. But at the same time, from a responsibility perspective and, and worried about the cost of our system and, and the burden of freight on ratepayers, uh, we, it would be our responsibility to continue to explore. Thank you. Mark? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Largry. Um, given the fact that you were involved in some of the outset of the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency's uh, inception, can you tell us your uh, knowledge of it, and in particular, currently, as to where things are with what that agency is doing, in particular with our district? Um, so the, uh, the Groundwater Sustainability Act obligates critically overdrafted aquifers to be managed in a way that will bring them into uh, balance, where the uh, withdrawal of water is offset by the recharge that the aquifer gets um, from rain and other sources. The, um, uh, as I remarked, I haven't been to a, a meeting in a couple of years. My recollection that some of the parties to it are the Scotts Valley Water District, San Lorenzo Valley Water District, and the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, and 
uh, water sharing or conjunctive use is uh, the, um, the uh, considered state-of-the-art practice for balancing aquifers, which is where you uh, use surface water when it's available and groundwater only when surface water is not available. Um, the, um, so so it, what, what I would argue is that our, what we should be trying to do is to get our pipeline back up and running our Boulder Creek streams feeding back into our system so that we are less reliant on, on groundwater and can take advantage of our sur surface water resources. Um, and, and avoid having to get pushed into the Santa Cruz city water. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on to the next person. And that is Alina Lang. Hi. Um, Oh, my name is Lena Lang, and I'm an environmental scientist. I'm I'm probably not a new face to most of you. I've been involved with the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for the past four years, um, three of which I served on the Environmental and Engineering Committee. And in uh, 2022, I ran in the election uh, for a board seat, which actually resulted in the closest election in the county. It was almost a near three-way tie at the bottom. And I only lost by 51 votes, which really highlights the the, the community um, has support in me. And it's also a really great victory seeing how I was outspent 10 to 1. But I, I actually originally got involved in the water district after the CZU fire, took houses on my street and in the community that I loved. And I saw this as an opportunity to be able to give back to my community, um, given my background. You know, it's been four years since the fire and our surface and in, surface and water intakes. Um, they're still not back online. Um, uh, we decided a method for laying the pipe, and we need to focus on that after the hazard tree removals. Our remediation um, is complete, and um, to get the remaining um, surface intakes back online as quickly as possible. And this is important because balancing our surface and groundwater is critical to sustaining our drinking water for generations to come. You know, this district operates on a tight budget uh, where supplemental grants eases the ratepayers' burden drastically. And during my appointment on the E&E committee, I encourage the district to seek grant funding for the Fall Creek Fish Ladder. You know, this being a mandated project, uh, I was disqualified for a lot of grants, but I attended uh, workshops and discovered that the district actually did qualify for Prop 1 funding. I ended up writing a letter of recommendation, and ultimately the district was awarded $1.1 million. So my promise to ratepayers is always to seek funding elsewhere before putting that burden um, uh, back on the, the, the customers. And a little bit of my background outside of the district, um, I was actually asked to come to California by the National Marine Fishery Service to apply my expertise in salmonid survival studies, uh, particularly in utilizing telemetry technology to help better understand how drought conditions affect salmonid migration. And uh, this is important because having the ability to monitor fish migration and behaviors is critical to understanding the impacts of extreme climate conditions or water operations and also being able to develop management strategy strategies to minimize these threats. But, uh, you know, I've been a public servant my entire career, whether it was representing the federal or state government, you know, collecting critical data or participating in non propriety research to create new open source uh, technological advancements, you know, in these roles. Um, I fostered uh, relationships with NGOs and private landowners, as well as our, our local federal agencies to allow site access and build partnerships among these agencies. And uh, here locally, I've been involved in a lot of things as well. Um, I is including installing monitoring equipment at the Felton Bladder Dam and conducting topographic land surveys for the Carmel Dam uh, removal geomorphological study. You know, being someone who has hiked our watershed extensively doing habitat and fish surveys really gives me a unique insight into the needs of our ecosystem. Um, I also sit on the Boulder Creek Recreation and Parks uh, uh, 
district uh, master uh, plan task force, God say that five times fast, uh, where we're working on, on getting ready for a really fun community event, August uh, 11th, where we're picking, kicking off our community survey so we can mold parks into what the community needs. And I would love to see this board join us. So as you guys are making policies for a community, you can better understand how it affects us all. I've also over there um, taken on the Barber Day Park and have been working with the RCD, which is the Recreational Conservation District, on um, how we can increase fish passage around the current barrier that is located there. But besides my scientific expertise, uh, I care deeply about the affordability of clean drinking water and addressing equity of water in an era of rising costs. I know that we're all feeling, uh, feeling <laughs> this inflation right now. So I, you know, I advocated for the expansion of the low income rated system program before the last rate increase to help offset some of the burden for the community members who would be most impacted. And on a personal note, you know, I'm an avid mushroom picture, picker. Um, I enjoy hiking and camping with my wonderful husband and son. The last research project I was a part of was published. I decided to be uh, more available to my family because my work required a lot of travel. So I kind of just throw myself into volunteer work, which is more flexible when raising a family. So this means like sitting on the board, this will be my sole focus and I can dedicate myself fully to this end endeavor. And I just want to thank the board for your consideration and I'd be honored to serve our community. And I'm sorry I can't be there in person today, but COVID has entered the chat for the very first time in my family. So I'll just try and keep you guys all safe. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie? Sure. Thank you, Alina, for joining us and for um, all of the years that you have participated with the Water District. I appreciate your involvement. Um, I, I think that your expertise and background makes it clear uh, what role you could fill with the district. But if you could just um, take a moment to talk a little bit about what you see as um, uh, how your background would help um, improve the board's ability to make decisions, what you would bring to the policy analysis process. Oh, are you there? She froze. She froze. She looks frozen. Oh, no. Hmm. Well, let's wait a bit. Maybe she'll be back. I'm sorry. Let's wait a bit. Maybe she'll be back. Yeah. Um, Scott, got any ideas here? Probably on her end. <laughs> yeah, it probably is. She's probably lost, lost connection because our other connections are working. Um, her phone number. Yeah, can she, she dial in? She might not. No, she's. Oh, oh, yep. There we go. Now she disappeared. Let's see if she'll come back in. Worst case scenario, we can get her. Elena, please come back in. There's Mark. Did we lose Mark there also. Yeah, Mark is there. He's, I see his. Yeah. There he is now. But. Hmm. Yes, just to let you know, yes, I still have a connection. Okay. You didn't we didn't lose you momentarily or anything? No, I'm just okay. shutting my camera off to save bandwidth on this end. Okay, thank you. Well, um Elena, please okay. call back in. Can you call her? Um okay. what if I I um, would like to make a proposal to yes. procedure. Um, could we, I know it would be an imposition to the candidates who've spoken, but if we could move to the next item, perhaps while we give Lena time to see if she can call back in, we could take up another board item and then come back to this with that. What um, do you think about give that? Give me a second here. I'm going to talk. Are you able to get back in? Oh, oh she's called her. I know. Okay. She's calling the phone. Yeah, she can no, call in. No, no, call the Zoom meeting. She'd be on audio. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can call into the Zoom meeting from your phone. It's okay. It's all right. The signal is really bad. All right. <laughs> all right. Bye. See. So, what is she doing? She's in a call in. To Zoom from her 
Okay. So that way we can at least finish the interview, but she's a little spotty, so. Okay, well, okay. let's give her a minute here and see if she could come in. She's put a lot of effort into this and she's uh, put a lot of effort into the, into the district. And so I think it's, uh, we owe her the couple of minutes here that it'll take to see if she can get back in. There's a 541 number. I think that's her. Yeah, that is her. Did we get one? We need to permit yeah, her. Yeah, she's in the attendees list. Okay. So we just have to open that up. Yeah. Can you promote the 541 phone number, please? Alina Lang. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Hey, I'm the Zoom kick me. Uh, Jamie, could you please repeat your question? Sure. Um, I was asking um, uh, how your specific expertise would inform your policy analysis and um, your role as a board member. Yeah, well, I think especially for this short-term appointment that I come a lot with a lot of background knowledge about the inner workings of the district. Um, that I know that took over the years to um, gain and, you know, be knowledgeable what projects are currently happening and just things that have happened in the past, you know, so we're not kind of repeating uh, the, the same thing. But um, we go for the DNE committee, but we had to install like a, a wall after. Um, that we weren't expecting and like you know we had discussions about how to prevent that in in the future and such so just coming in uh with the knowledge that's already um happened in the district um i think that's um, and also you know just having the the scientific background coming into this i think that's kind of um, an area that is lacking on the board that i can add to it Thank you. Um, I would ask you about your committee involvement, but Alina, I know you've been deeply involved in both the Environmental and Engineering Environmental Committee for years um, and have had a big impact on um, the committees there. So in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and pass this off to Jeff. Okay, thank you. Um, so Elena, uh, if you had to narrow it down to one thing that was the most important going forward that you had to, you wanted to work on, what is the, your number one priority for uh, the board? Yeah, well, we are, you know, four years uh, post uh, CZU, for, and there's still a long ways to go. Uh, so I would say recovering from the CZU fire, both financially and you know, rebuilding the infrastructure. Like I said, my statement, our certain water intakes are still down. It's much needed to help us balance um, our surface water and our groundwater, uh, not over dropping uh, the, our offer. Um, we also have millions in grant money uh, due to expire that needs to be set, spent to help connect, you know, my neighbors. I live pretty close to them in Bracken Bray and Forest Springs who have been ravaged by the fire and they've been limping away on this failing water system. Uh, but we will be making smart moves as we proceed so we can help our neighbors and not you know lose funding that we so desperately need. Thank you. Bob? Uh, yeah, Selena, I had the same question for you as the others. Uh, uh, your thoughts about a potential merger between Scott Valley Water District and San Lorenzo Valley Water District? Yeah, well, I mean, as far as knowledge, this isn't even anything that is being considered at the time. Uh, so um, it's kind of an interesting question of me. 
but I think at this time, especially with the fact that we don't have surface water intake to, uh, to set up, I think that that would not be a smart move to take on more customers uh, financially. See where it is beneficial to um, our rate payers. I know a lot of people um, say that like they don't want to see rate increases, but we're using less water, which means less money. I mean, it. and if there is a financial appealing aspect of you know being able to pay the bill, but we can't pay the bill. There's no offer to share between us, and right now, like. In, with the Valley Given project that's happening, uh, you know, like financially, like it looks, it looks really good. But I think you brought up a point that, like, we don't have our surface in case you go and how are we supposed to spread what little water we do have further? It's our defense. We have all these other mergers um, coming on. So um, I, I would say right now that that it's really an issue because. It's not on the books. Okay, I caught about half of all the answers. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, Mark. Yes, Leah. Um, thanks for your uh, continued interest in the water district, uh, given uh, the involvement that you've had in the engineering and environmental committees, which I've been on for the last three years. Um, I'll ask the same question about the Santa Margarita district. And uh, if you can keep your answers as, as succinct as you can, uh, you're cutting out often for us. Uh, okay. I think the biggest class was the um, GSP or the, the Basin Groundwater Sustainability Plan. And I did attend many of the meetings back that they were going to be using for that. Um, I found that really interesting that, uh, that this is in a shorter amount of time. And um, so we have, you know, specific challenges um, around that. Uh, and then you know, the Margarita was developed so we can prevent the groundwater from long-term um, decline in the basin, which is uh, really important because our summer stream flows um, all come from groundwater here. It's, you know, essential that we maintain the basin. Okay, Next on the proposed agenda here is for board discussion, allowing each director to speak uh, at least once uh, to uh, weigh their choice or... Well, actually, you uh, have public comment? Uh, yes, we'll also have public comment, but... Um, Should we start with public start, comment? Start with public. Yeah, we'll start with public comment. So, comments from the public. Please give us your name and uh, where you're from. Deborah Lowen, Long Pico Canyon. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very impressive outline here for the candidates. And really happy to see so many good uses. Um, we seem heavily tilted towards engineers and environmentalists. We have fine engineers and fine environmentalists on our staff. So that would be both an asset and probably not quite fill the gap that we need, which I feel is really important, and that's business. So the board is here to set policy and to set guardrails. And I think that the best person here is Karen Brown, and I'd just like to relate a story of how I met her. I joined the district from Long Pico in about 2016 and came to a budget hearing meeting for the board where they talked about all the different things. And coming from Long Pico, I had an acute interest in the budget and where money was going and how much money was coming in and the cost of our water. And I asked a number of questions and they, both staff and the board weren't able to really answer them. But after the meeting, Karen Brown came up to me with a big stack that was the budget that they were working on. 
And she said, if you'd like to go over those, I can answer all your questions. And she did. She did very succinctly and clearly. <clears throat> she understood the budget a lot better than a lot of people in the room. And I was really impressed. And I carried that impression forward with her. She also has the experience with maintaining a water system. And I think that's really valuable. So I would like to support Karen. Thank you. Do we have another member of the public that wishes to speak? Hey, yes, I'm Jim Bozier from Belta, and I also want to just say how um, appreciative I, I am of all four of you who uh, applied. Um, when the seat became open, I was concerned, as happened at the school board, that nobody might apply. Um, and we have four uh, good candidates, and I think that, that it really speaks well to our community that people are willing to step up during this really difficult time for the district. Um, I, I thought, uh, I, I've known Brian Larday a long time. I thought uh, his resume was really impressive. He brings a lot of expertise and experience. Uh, I think he'd be an outstanding board member. So I support him. I also support Alina Lane, who has given so much time to the district. And uh, I think there should be some consideration to the fact that she ran last time uh, and came in one down so that if Gail had resigned before the election, she would have been the, the next candidate. So I think that's something just to consider. But in terms of uh, what I, the candidate I think would bring the most to the board right now, I think Brian would just be an outstanding uh, it's just outstanding that he's willing to do this. And maybe um, since there's going to be another seat available, the other the candidates could uh, come again. Um, so you can have two people and you have a great pool to pull from. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from the public? I don't see anybody online. Hi, my name is Mark Lee. I'm from Ben Loman. I've been here for 32 years. Um, I was quite impressed with the candidates. All, they're all fantastically qualified. And uh, it seems like we have an overweight of Peltonians here, <laughs> which may say something. But uh, uh, I really uh, like Brian uh, Larkay's uh, technical skills in hydrology, very important. His background on uh, in the land conservation uh, exercises and his analysis of uh, water resources in wetlands. I also like Anita Lang's uh, background in fish and environmental management. Very excellent qualifications, and she's been serving quite a long time uh, on the on the as a committee member as a great. Uh, <laughs> and, expertise. and I also want to congratulate Karen Brown for coming back again. She has excellent operational skills, particularly in finance and accounting and water district management. So I don't think we should uh, discount that. So, you know, you have a, uh, you have four real well qualified candidates, and uh, I won't uh, recommend. Yeah, any single person, but they're all very well qualified. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments from the public? Can we check online. Too? Um, I don't see anyone online. Do you see anyone else online? No. Nobody with their hand raised. I'm sorry. Nobody with their hand raised. Yeah. Well, there yeah. Are people there, but they don't. They're not raising their hand. Yeah, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. So now moving on to board discussion. Um, before entertaining any motions, um, Mark, let's start with you. Do you have any comments or observations to make here? Yes. Um, I am. Uh, Similar to the last two commenters from the public, um, impressed by uh, Brian Largay's resume um, and the 
fact that he has served on the uh, Santa Cruz County Water uh, Commission um, and brings the, uh, what appears to be a wealth of knowledge in uh, land use from a water perspective, which is important to our district. Um, and likewise, I am uh, appreciative of the time and effort that Alina has put into this over the past uh, several years, including uh, being willing to run for the last election. Um, so faced with a, with a tough choice, um, but at this point, um, I think my selection is Brian. Thank you. Bob? Um, I'm going to say something that I wasn't able to say when this came up the first time because it was a meeting that was scheduled when I just was not able to attend. I think it was one of the first ones I've had to miss due to it being scheduled out of cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am deeply concerned about what is a recurring pattern in this valley of resignations taking place just before the election happens, allowing uh, a person to be um, appointed and then filing as an incumbent, an appointed incumbent, but still the ward incumbent. Um, I find that is a uh, affront to our system of government. Um, I think it's an affront to our community to do that. I know at the school board, we had a situation where there were three people on it that had been appointed and they were about to do a fourth before somebody said, oh, wait a minute, maybe this isn't the best look. Um, we are within literally one month of the filing period opening down at the county for local candidates, July 15th. Um, this should have just gone to an election um, and not go through this process where we're effectively giving somebody a leg up on what I think are four really qualified candidates that should all be making a case on a level playing field to the electorate if they choose to run come this November. This, this is just an affront to uh, the way we should be doing things here. And I know we do it over and over and over again in our Valley. It is part of, unfortunately, the, the insider baseball that goes on here. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not enthusiastic about doing any appointments um, at this point. No offense to anybody individually. I think you all bring uh, strengths here. And I also recall Brian saying five years ago about ruthless efficiency, which uh, certainly resonated with me at the time. Um, Karen's focus on finance. Um, while I do have some concerns um, about uh, Michael's relatively lack of involvement to date, I definitely want to encourage him, whether or not he gets appointed tonight or not, uh, we will likely have a committee um, uh, committee openings that we're going to need to do again, and certainly would encourage him to, uh, to get involved in that way as well, but perhaps on the budget and finance committee. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, this, this just needs to go to election. Um, I, we're not good to be giving people a leg up like this. So, Jamie. um, I appreciate what Bob's saying. And actually, I probably will shock Bob by saying I, I agree with you in the timing. The problem is, um, I I don't think that there's any conspiracy here. There were very substantial health issues in Gail's life that needed to be addressed. Um, she had to sell her house here and therefore was no longer going to be a resident of the Valley and could not legally continue to serve on the board. I have sold my house, and as of June 24th, I will not be a resident of the Valley and cannot legally serve on this board. So while I know my fellow board member likes to see conspiracy theories where there are not, unfortunately, sometimes life just moves on, and it doesn't line up perfectly with election seasons. And while the timing of this would suggest that in a perfect world, we let this go to an election and let the electorate to make those decisions, we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world where this district has to get things done between now and the November election. And with three board members 
who may not all be able to be physically present at every meeting, which will be required if you don't appoint anybody else, we may not be having meetings for the next few months and therefore nothing will get done. And so while in, in a perfect democracy, we would allow this to go to an election, I don't think that the water district would be well served for us to do that in this case. And therefore, I believe we should appoint somebody to fill this position tonight because my position will be vacant shortly thereafter. Now, to the issue at hand, um, there are two people that I think really rise above, and I appreciate everybody's applications, but um, I think that in replacing um, a, a board member for whom I held just very high esteem, I'd like to you know, ensure that someone who brings a similar kind of background and, and scientific disposition to that position um, can take that role, particularly because we will need that in our continued um, uh, participation in the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency conversations, and those are going to be critical to the long-term uh, financial health and overall water health of this valley. So um, with that being said, um, I, given your background, uh, Brian, uh, with the Margar Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency and your deep involvement in water issues in Santa Cruz County, um, that is where I would uh, put my vote tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to say to Alina that if I could vote for two people tonight and one to replace me, I would vote for you too. Um, so I hope that she'll be given serious consideration when you replace me uh, down the road. Thank you. So I agree with my fellow board members that we have four excellent candidates here. Each of them have a different flavor, a different area of primary focus. Um, all of them are very capable and um, impressive people. Um, like my colleague, Jamie, I think that Mr. Largay's qualifications are uh, the strongest, both from a technical and from experience on various other boards and organizations and intergovernmental agencies. Um, I would say that uh, my second choice, I'm torn between uh, Elena and Ms. Brown. And I'm not sure which one I would pick if I did not have uh, Mr. Largay as my first choice, but I'm, I'm not gonna get into this in any great depth. I just think his, his academic and work experience and uh, knowledge of the workings of the regional area here in terms of water and conservation are so strong that uh, I think he's the logical choice. So, um, I think we've heard from all the board members. I'm going to make a motion that we appoint Brian Largay to fill this position and uh, I'll ask for a second. Um, I, I will second that motion to find that the board uh, seat has become vacant as of May 3rd and that we are agreeing to fill the vacancy by appointment. Yes. And uh, that we are directing the interim general manager to proceed with the posting notice of the vacancy. Wait, I'm sorry. We already directed the interim general manager to proceed with the posting notice of the vacancy with June 6 at 3 p.m. as the closing date. Sorry. And you have the, that's the am I reading the wrong thing? Yeah, yeah. I'm yes. so sorry. You're, you're reading your vacancy, I think. Oh, well, I was trying to get ahead of things. My bad. I guess I supposed to. You just want to get out the door faster. <laughs> sorry. I'm not sure your, where. Your, your okay. taxi is waiting. <laughs> my, my house is half packed right now. Um, so anyhow, I would like to support the motion to appoint yes. Brian Largay as the uh, interim uh, director. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any further comment from the public? Any further comment from the board? Ah, oh, we have one more. Please. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to be heard here. Hi, this is Mark. Say again from uh, Ben Bowman. Uh, I happen to, after thinking about it, we have four great candidates. I think Bob Fultz is correct. I think we should not appoint tonight and let the narrative for each candidate stand on its own and have them run in the November election. <laughs> And I think it's fair to have that done. Have if you to vote now. Operate within that framework, you have three members currently now, correct? 
And uh, so I would say, do not appoint tonight and wait for the election. Unfortunately, so, we have a motion and a second um, already, so we do need to proceed. Yes. We call a roll for the vote. Yes. President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Director Fultz? Abstain. And Director Smalley? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. So that means, Mr. Largay, if you could join us actually at the dais, you are appointed as of right now and a board member to proceed for the evening, as I understand that. Um, Barbara, yes. can you confirm that he begins acting immediately? Well, thank you, President. Um, I didn't see that in the motion, so... That was how it was handled in previous board meetings. So, for example, when we appointed um, Jeff Hill at uh, the board meeting a couple of years ago, he began acting as a board mm -hmm. member immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you, you can do that. Yeah. Okay. They are appointed as soon as you appoint them. Okay. Well, if you have yeah, the time chair. and ability, we would like yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Uh, and thank you to the other three candidates um as i said i was very impressed overall uh this agency is blessed to have people who are so um, eager to serve and so qualified so thank you all very much and it looks like we've got another vacancy coming up for this office. We'll move on to the next one. okay next on the agenda um, replacements Department of Water Resources Tanks Replacement Project Agreement for Design. Thank you, President. Um, as you know, we brought this to you last week, um, June 6th, and I understand there, there was some concern about the fact that there was a $200,000 difference between the two consultants. And I understand that some more information will be helpful for you to make a decision to understand how staff arrived at its decision. Um, and so in this report, basically the same, but I did include um, the criteria that staff used to evaluate them. And these were the criteria that were listed in the RFP. So when we send out the RFP to the consultants, the request for proposals, um, try not to use the acronyms, but um, each of the consultants was notified that this is how we would rank and what weighting we would apply to each one of these criteria. Um, and so we know one of them was past performance, including cost and schedule control. And we would have to say that as of late, there have been some issues with one of the candidates, which is Sandus, and some of the projects, and enough for us to not get as favorable a score, let's say, um, as Ms. C.D. Miller. And so we also look, the proposal fee is 10% of the total ranking. So how we rank the consultants from one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what we said in the RFP, and this is typical that somewhere between maybe 10 and 20, sometimes 25% can go to basically is the cost, but basically it is a qualifications based, as we had said before, qualifications based um, review and ranking. And so I wanted to leave you with that, that and also consider that on a 5 million-ish, 4.5 million, 5 million-ish job, if you imagine 200,000 is about 4% of the project cost. And we've seen mistakes by maybe oversight by in a design, a design emission. Um, we even had just the change orders on paving alone in some of these jobs total more than 200,000. So while I understand being cost conscious, and that was not lost on me in this decision, the 200,000 was not something that was lost on me, but the overall efficiency in selecting the most qualified person was, and the need to also move this project along. So hence it's back in front of you, and I will 
leave it to questions for staff. We have Garrett as well, the engineer, engineering manager, myself can answer questions. Mark, do you have any questions on this? Yes, I do. Um, Brian, you've um, alluded to concerns with Sandus. Um, but they were, uh, their bid was deemed um, qualified, correct? They, uh, they, they, met, they met the basic requirements. Uh, there isn't such a, there isn't such a category when you're dealing with ranking consultants. There isn't some minimum, you're thinking maybe a, a in a bid for construction, there's either a bidder is qualified or they're not. Um, I'm used to the word responsive. Correct, responsive, and that's you're, now you're talking about contracts, not right. a, not a professional services. Okay, um, you've uh, alluded to concerns over Sandus. Um, can you cite any examples? for design aspects on some of the recent projects that, uh, that caused the concern. Um, we're dealing with five tanks um, and I understand that uh, on any one of those tanks, uh, if I did the math, 45,000 increase on, on each of the tanks results in the the net difference of what you're talking about, but um, I'm looking for something substantiative that's allowing you to say, no, not Santos. Well, as we said, if, if there's certain, there have been certain design oversights that cause cost overruns, mm -hmm. uh, there was, can you name a couple? Of yeah, we had to add a mixer to the Blue Ridge tank that cost the district $41,700. Right, okay. The design of the concrete ring foundation wasn't sized properly in the construction documents. That was, I believe, $26,500 extra for the additional concrete. We had to add a site retaining wall. That was $80,000. There was an error in the placement of the reinforcement in the retaining wall that we identified during inspections. So the contractor is seeking another, I believe it's over $10,000 for epoxy and rebar and correcting that mistake in the design. The paving was over 300,000. And, and these were all a project that Sandus, Sandus provided us the design Four. Correct. That's the 2021 CIP project. So that's okay. Blue Ridge Tank, uh, Juanita Woods Pipeline, Hermosa Avenue Pipeline, Sandy Drive Pipeline. Okay. And um, to compare to um, your recommended contractor then, or I'm sorry, your recommended design firm, because we've had recent experience with them also. Is there similar? Is there significantly less? Um, give me. Um, I'm aware that um, CD Miller Engineering, they were the engineer record for the probation tank. I believe mm -hmm. that was the, uh, the APWA project of the year in 2020. I know there was a change order on that project due to the thickness of the shell. We requested, I think, a 3 16 inch steel uh, for the roof, mm -hmm. which was thicker than the bid documents. <clears throat> Um, I'm not, I didn't work at the district at the time, so I'm not familiar with all the change orders on the probation tank. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, that's all the questions that I have for now. 
Thanks. Bob, go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, of the items that you were talking about there, how many of those are misses in the design work versus perhaps not being given full context around specifications or what we wanted? Because I know sometimes what can come back from a consultant can depend on what the statement of work says that they're supposed to do. So for the design of these tanks, it's usually a deferred submittal. So a manufacturer hired by the contractor provides the design of the tank. That would be the size of the bolts, how far apart they're spaced, the thickness of the metal, the coatings, all that's provided by the manufacturer, by their engineers in-house. So the design engineer, what they need to do is they need to make a site plan. They need to show overall dimensions, fencing, yard piping, um, where we want to connect to the tank, where the overflow is going to be, where that overflow is going to go. Um, you know, we got to have something in the documents to bid as far as the concrete ring foundation. But ultimately, that is sized by the manufacturer. Um, it would be my hope that Sandus having had these problems on Blue Ridge Tank, that they would be a lot better in the future with knowing what we know now, instead of showing a foundation that's one foot by three foot, our foundation ended up being four foot by three foot. So obviously there's more materials, so you have, we have to pay more as the owner. I mean, it would be better for me at least is if they showed more scope in the construction documents and then we get a construction and we say, hey, we don't need a, we don't need a, a five foot wide foundation. It only needs to be four feet wide and we get a credit back. And then we would have the competitive bid pricing rather than change order pricing, which we all know the contractors take to their advantage. So on the design of the concrete ring and the mixer, is that something that the manufacturer said you needed to do and then they just blew it? Is that is that what I'm hearing? Well, the manufacturer will size the concrete based on their tank design. and it'd be better for the district if they'd shown a substantial concrete ring foundation rather than a, a skimpy one, because we end up paying for that additional bit. Yeah, yeah, but I, what I'm trying to do is get to is, is Sandus really ultimate? I mean, I understand that design came out of them, but was it because they were giving bad information by the manufacturer? Well, you don't know who the manufacturer is gonna be. The manufacturer is hired by the contractor. I see. So it's a deferred submittal. Okay. So you have to. So you have to design worst case, is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. Yes. Okay. And the same thing with a mixer. The mixer. Um, it's my understanding the state water board mandated that we put in a mixer because our tank exceeded 100,000 gallons. Would that have been known to anybody? Why wouldn't that have been I known to us, for example? I feel like it should have been known, and going forward, it will be known. But I mean, known to us, not just to the yes, owned by us. But, but this was prior to your. Yeah, and these, this was all yeah, prior, to your, prior to when I worked. I don't. I, I don't know. I. I mean, you know, first of all, I'm very troubled by having cost only being 10 percent of the overall evaluation. You know, 220 thousand dollars is effectively anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of a tank coating, and when you start adding these numbers up, it it eventually gets to real money. Um, and whether or not we like it or whether or not we want to accept it, this is not a wealthy community. We don't have money running out of our ears. Um, we have tons of things that have to do. We have to be incredibly um, stingy with our money and how we spend it. Even if that means we say to Sandus, you got to do a worst case design. Maybe they needed to get that kind of a uh, of guidance. Again, it comes down to, you know, a lot about what they get in the statement of work. I don't know that this went to a committee. It doesn't look like it did. If it did, I certainly wasn't one that I was on. Um, I'm still troubled by this. It, it, if it was fifteen or twenty thousand dollars or even forty thousand dollars, it wouldn't. I probably wouldn't be this concerned. But this is a substantial amount of money, and I don't think Sandus's work. Um, here has been overall that bad for us 
that we need to leave two hundred and twenty thousand dollars on the table. So I, I I still can't support this. I expect others will, but I I can't. Jamie. So um, I'm 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 I'm. I understand the arguments here and I'm just trying to boil them down because I'm I'm not on the engineering committee and I don't have that sort of technical um, perspective, but I think what you're saying is that if that you believe that the, the work that Miss City Miller can do for us on this project will minimize the risk of change orders and produce a more efficient project, um, that can be completed more successfully and more quickly. I mean, that's kind of what I'm, when I, as a board member, am being asked to weigh, should I spend $200,000 more on a tank um, by choosing one engineering firm that we haven't chosen frequently over another that we've done a lot of work with for less? I, I want to know, am I getting a lot of value for that additional $200,000? And um, while I hear what you're saying about Sandus, and I also do want to note the irony of the fact that, you know, so some board members on this board spend a lot of time focused on complaining about change orders. So I, I would like to see us address those and reduce those. Yes. Um, you know, I also think as a government, as a long-term government employee, that government does itself a disservice when it always chooses the lowest uh, vendor because sometimes that is not the best value to the community. So I'm trying to sort of get to is the value there with the city Miller since I don't know them and I don't know how exactly to evaluate that. Thank you. I can just elaborate a little bit. Director Ackman is when we say past performance and cooling cost and schedule control. So that not only there were mistakes in design that led to cost over overruns or change orders, but also, and also their costs, which we hadn't talked about, but there was a number of, I don't know, I seem to remember signing enough changes in that regard. And also schedule control, which we also know leads to delays lead to costs because then it trends, how would I say it? transfers out to other consultants, the other consultants on the job when they start and stop the labor compliance, et cetera. So, and remember, I mean, staff, this is what staff does is analyze all this. And we're, we're saying pretty definitely in unison here is we did evaluate, we gave these criteria and these criteria um, we feel in this case, given past performance issues and just looking at what we were submitted for this job, price and everything included, that it's still, yes, and $200,000 is really, you may be spending that much more, but we're also taking that into consideration that it could probably avoid those kind of costs at least. So it's the whole package. We're saying that all, all in, that this is, these are, that this is the consultant choose um, one more question yes, go ahead. Um, when you um, put together your rubric for evaluating um, proposals um, is it always that 10 percent of the overall evaluation is allocated to cost because that does seem low it's not always 10 percent. sometimes it's a little higher okay it depends on what else we're trying to weigh in there um, you know we want to make sure that in this case we're hiring somebody with experience on tanks that could do this kind of work. So, but always I make sure that we do have a weighted cost in there because if you don't at all, I mean, it certainly, if it, if it was skewed too much, you could disqualify somebody based on being too expensive. Right. All of the things being equal, you say, well, we've got two equally valued consultants, 10% is enough to throw it. So, I am not intimately familiar with this particular bid. Sure. Do you need to go to Brian? Pardon? Brian. Oh, yes, Brian, you go first. Uh, can I make a point, Gordon? Um, before entering the duties of office, each director shall take and subscribe the official oath and file it with the secretary. He's not yet seated. Yes, we do have to do that. Um, 
until that happens, he can't. He's yeah, just, he's he a can't vote public. Yeah, he I, can't vote until we, we well, vote. he can't even speak as a board member. He has yeah. to come over here. Does, I, and I think you should just administer the vote. Yeah, um, yeah, that's how we've typically done it. Take a, a short recess, perhaps. And yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. Do you have access to the oath of office? Um, if I can get to the admin drive. It's in the state constitution. <laughs> Mr. Holloway, if there's a vacancy on the board, you should consider it. Thing we got prepped. I'm sorry. Good thing we got prepped. Yeah. The elections department has a PDF on it. I don't think you've been called on to speak again, Mr. Holloway. I think Mr. Holloway was trying to be helpful so yes, we can is. move things along. And, you know, for that, I'm grateful, actually. Yes. I'm sure you are. Because, you know, we don't we don't want to be sitting here wasting the community's time either. You know, she's a brand new board secretary, and this is all a big process to learn. Perhaps we could have grace. Yes. Okay. This is so shall I read this oath? So the way that oh, you hand over your heart. Sure. And you'll just read. You'll just read this. Just Very as good. I put your thing and then read that. Thank you. I, Brian Largay, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, pertaining to the tank, the contract, et cetera, the, um, what can I contribute? Uh, I uh, am familiar with MME. Uh, they are a very high reputation firm. Uh, it, it, I don't believe it's a conflict of interest, but I'll disclose that they are a contractor working for me presently in my uh, work at the land trust. They're designing boardwalks and, um, uh, wildlife viewing platforms at a wetland preserve that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I am unfamiliar with Sandus. I um, uh, have worked on water tanks as a um, geotechnical inspector in the construction of water tanks. Uh, and uh, I'm familiar with the enormous mass associated with them, especially in geologically active areas and the um, extraordinary sensitivity of the design and construction, especially of the foundation and the risks associated with failure are uh, daunting. <clears throat> uh, I, uh, so having excellent uh, design is an appropriate use of district resources. I'm unfamiliar with Sandus. Uh, I um, uh, am, uh, surprised that there are only two bidders, uh, and yet um, that happens, and it's a difficult environment to get 
responsiveness. I think there's been a lot of act economic activity recently that makes that challenging. Um, I am uh, inclined to defer to staff. We have professional staff for a reason. And I think that in proportion to the overall project costs, the design is, it, you typically expect 15% to go into design. And I, um, we're, we're at 6%, I believe, if that's mm -hmm. give or take. Um, no, excuse me, we're at 12% with this. Um, and so that is, you know, um, at any rate, uh, I would be inclined to uh, support staff and get this work done and have uh, confidence in the engineering that's performed, uh, both for the uh, cost savings on the construction side of things and the reliability of the facility once mm -hmm. installed. Wow. I appreciate you bringing up the potential for a conflict of interest. I did have a question as a follow-up to that. Um, were you directly involved in, and or did you make the decision to hire MME in your in your present? Um, I did not. Okay. So you work with them, but you weren't involved in the hiring decision. That's correct. Okay. Could I add something? We navigated this territory uh, in the past. I was director of marketing communications for Santa Cruz Metro, and in that capacity, was involved with the hiring of Miller Maxfield, and and subsequently was able to vote on the selection of Miller Maxfield as a vendor here without any problem as a board member. So I don't see why that would be a conflict of interest. I, I, I'm I'm not saying it is. I wanted to get the additional context, and hopefully, Brian, you're not taking any. It's just business, not take nothing personal. Just wanted yeah. to understand the context. That's Clarity it. is good. Clarity is good. I don't think it fits. Yeah. So what I'm hearing here is that for this premium, we are going to have a project that may not qualify again for project of the year, but we'll get close. They'll have few, if any, change orders, and we'll just sail through the process with no problem. That's my expectation now, given that we're going to pay this kind of premium. So... So I would I would um, temper that with no change or, or very few change orders related to design errors or omissions and such, but change orders that we initiate because we didn't specify something correctly or whatever that we can't hold them for you know. If, we give them the wrong specification or something like that. I'm going to go beyond that. And that is, these guys are so good that they should be asking questions Absolutely. if they encounter anything. So Absolutely. we should not ever get into a situation where there's an issue later on. Or if it is, it's a very, very small number of items. Very small number. Okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. So, do we have a motion here? I will move that we execute professional services agreement with the City Miller Engineering for design of DWR tank replacements and amount not to exceed $671,727,727 and authorizes the interim general manager to execute a non-substantive notification as necessary. I will second that. President Young? Yes. Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Uh, uh, Director Fultz? No. And Director Smelly? Yes. And our she new director. One more. Uh, look, one more. Sorry. <laughs> I used to have it before you. Okay, Director Largay. Yes. All right. Motion passes. Um, I would like to comment further, Jeff, if I may. Yes, please. Um, Garrett? Director Fultz has laid out his charge to you on this. Minimizing change orders from the design consultant on this one. Minimizing contractor change orders. Um, and I hope that this um, uh, impression is expressed to them also. We're paying a premium to have them do this work we expect over and above from them on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
Okay, moving on to new business, notice of vacancy. Thank you, President. Well, we should be all salts at this now. Just one done this, so anticlimactic here, but um, we do have a new vacancy of Director Ackerman. Uh, her resignation is effective June 21st. The same uh, windows apply here. There's the 60 day window um, from that date for us to make a decision as, as a board. After that, the county could also make an appointment up to 90 days and then then there is neither neither body could make an appointment. Um, there is another window and I know one director has already spoken to this issue, but if you want to give that in person that's appointed the opportunity to list themselves as an appointed incumbent, the deadline is August 9th for them to file final to file with the county. Um, and so staff is recommending that you either appoint at the June 18th meeting or any special meeting up until and including uh, um, August 1st and August 1st being the, the next meeting that you could also appoint at. So to give you flexibility, you could either call a special meeting or do it at any of those, those meetings. And again, board policy is that you only do it at a regular regular meeting, which would be August 1st is the first one, but to give you the flexibility, we're also suggesting that deterrence from, from board policy. Mm -hmm. So other than that, I think uh, the motion is clear and the recommend, recommendations from staff are clear. Um, so thank you. Any questions? Bob? Um, in this case, neither incumbent is filing for re-election. Therefore, would it not extend an additional five days for county, or actually for state code? At least that's what I'm reading here on the votes count website for the uh, for the calendar. It goes to August 14th. Okay, that's possible. I don't yet. Uh, votescount.com. Go to the main page. Click on November election. Quick calendar, and it's right there. So it would be an extension because neither Gail nor Jamie are running for the yeah. election. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't follow all of that with the dates because I didn't have a calendar in front of me. But uh, yeah, so the filing period opens the 15th. Yes. And then the 9th is the cutoff date unless the incumbents don't either of the incumbents don't okay. file, in this case, both. Then it goes five more days, so to the 14th. Okay. That's the actual. That's the actual day. final, final date. Okay. So, do we need any discussion on this? At oh, this point? oh, yeah. Yes. I mean, I know we do, but. Yeah. Um, Mr. Largay, let's start with you. I, the, um, the, <clears throat> the issue is, should we appoint a replacement for Jamie? And, and the motion that we're considering is there? We would be up beginning the process of filling a vacancy with this motion, which would mean, you know, going out to make public the fact that there's a vacancy, opening an application window period to accept applications. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I think that it's clear that we have uh, broad community interest in serving on this board. I think that uh, it's helpful to have a full board. I, I think that uh, appointing uh, a person to the board is a fine thing to do, and, uh, and I'm comfortable with proceeding with that. Um, well, first of all, I, um, you know, personal circumstances in my life changed in such a way that we needed to relocate to be closer to my dad, who's elderly and was recently in nursing care because he broke a hip and couldn't go home. And um, so uh, we have made the decision to do this. And unfortunately, because I was not going to be running for election, the timing, you know, worked out for we found a perfect seller for our house, unfortunately. So. 
it is what it is. And I'm, I'm sorry to be leaving now when the district has so many issues. Um, Gail and I uh, listed our houses for sale on the same day and had no idea that we were doing that. Um, and sort of looked at each other and went, oh no. Um, so that was really just unfortunate timing. Um, that being said, I feel like I need to abstain from this discussion and decision because it feels wrong to me to decide for the district how it replaces me. Um, I, I think, I think that I would be compelled in either way to say that you need a fifth board member right away because if they're, you know, you, you may have board meetings where members are not available and you need a quorum, but I can also be compelled that it is very close to an election and with four bed board members, you could get by, um, until you could fill the seat. So therefore, because I sort of feel on the fence about this, I feel like I just need to stay out of it. Small. Pardon? Mark, go to Mark. Mark. Is there any way to promote Director Smalley so he's visible? He's promoted. Did they just spotlight any of Yes, start? I'm on. Yes, um, Mark. I, um, I am a supporter of, of the appointment process, um, having been appointed myself um, and having served the last uh, three and a half years. Um, I'm in favor of that. I understand we're close to an election, but uh, we are still at times, um, as we are this evening before we started the meeting, with only three members in attendance because I was out of the area on a family obligation. So in the event that one of our three attendees tonight were not available due to injury or illness, we wouldn't have been able to meet to discuss a time critical item, which is coming up in front of us. So thank you. So I am going to agree with uh, Director Smalley. Um, life throws changes at you. And um, this last couple of months, my family has had a very substantial change. And um, I'm very sensitive to the fact that I could well have been in Jamie's shoes or in Gail's shoes and have to either relocate or do something um, because of a family obligation. So um, I, I think it's important that we have a full board as much as possible. So um, I would like to ask that we have the motion. And I don't have public a, comment. Do, oh, public do, comment. Yes, of course. Uh, Bob, do I get to speak? Yes, you do. Okay. Um, you know, this is probably got to be the worst example of. Uh, taking um, a process that should legitimately go to election and putting it in the hands of us. Mm -hmm. um, even if we were to circumvent our board policy with uh, by basically inserting a regular board meeting mm -hmm. on the 18th when it's very clear that we said we wouldn't do that, um, we're only gonna you know, go to, you're right in the middle of the filing period. Yes. <laughs> the filing period opened three days before that. I mean, talk about trying to not only put a thumb on the scale, but an entire body on the scale. That's just wrong in so many ways. If I were the, if I were the people interested in applying, of course, you know, I can't speak for them. But I don't know that I'd want to get an advantage that way. That seems really, I mean, it, yeah, that, that's just not right. And I, I can't believe that we're, we are going to appoint somebody right in the middle of it. In fact, if we waited till August 1st, which would be a, a, a regular or a normal regularly scheduled meeting, the filing period would be almost up. Mm-hmm. 
In addition, this is the first time I've seen a vacancy declared before someone actually left the seat in order to get another week of time to count toward that 15 days. I, I No. In the past, we've done, I think, 45 days for opening um, in order to maximize the time that people have to apply. 15 days means only people with insider knowledge are really going to know about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just reeks up one side and down the other taking this action. Um, yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Anybody, anybody legitimately running should have a real field day with this one, that someone would actually go through and take this seat in the middle of a candidate filing period. I, I, I boy, that's it. But I get it. It's, it's the way the game is played, and it's San Lorenzo Valley plays those exceptions really well. So... Public comment. Public comments, please. I am Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. I am sorry I have to do this, but um, I kind of disagree with Paul. Uh, we there, there was a form on the agenda last week, and I kind of pointed out that Dale Mayhew is not an incumbent. Right? because she's not even in office. Um, and the man wasn't a, a week ago. Um, and, and I read Director Ackman's resignation letter and it says the 21st, which is next Friday. So she will not be an incumbent either. And so I don't agree that the filing period will be extended by five days. I think we have Two incumbents that have departed the scene essentially. And so there are no incumbents. Um, at the time of the filing period, there, there won't be any incumbents. So I, I guess I, I just wanted to express that. Um, I, don't, I don't see a reason why the filing period will be extended by five days. Bob? If we appoint two people and they're Incumbents for basically, you know, what in the case of Brian a month, in the case of the other person a few days, then yeah, I suppose it wouldn't be uh, extended. Um, but if we went to an election on this, then it would be because there, the incumbent would not be in, in place. Anyway, uh, you guys are going to vote for doing an appointment. I find it um, unbelievable, but it's sort of in line with, unfortunately, how business is done in the San Lorenzo Valley, and I, 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 I wish it were otherwise. I think we can easily get by with four people. Um, so far, we've not had any issues with that. Um, you were able to find a date mm -hmm. if we it had was, an event. It was hard, but I did. Well, you did. I wasn't able to make it, but yep. you were able to do it. On another day, I could make it, but somebody else could. That's right. Um, but you were able to make it work. And for those emergencies, should they come up, I have no doubt we'd be able to make it work with four. Um, to say that we need five, I think, is skirting around the real issue, which is withdrawing the ability of creating a level playing field for the people that are running in, in November. So, please, I have a from the yeah, public. I, I concur with uh, Commissioner, uh, Director uh, Fultz <clears throat> on this. We need to let the democratic process play out and stop stacking the court. It's ridiculous. Especially when we have a controversial ballot measure coming up. We can't sit there and just choose and pick our directors based on their political, you know, ideals and their particular political stances on certain practices within the district. I, I'm very offended that you're not letting us go to the uh, direct election. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that the citizens get to know those people that are running. And so I would recommend I can't once again, 
Got no more appointments. That's those that want to run and register should be able to register in time and run for board. We'll let everyone else know that they're running and what their reasons are. I think it's grossly unfair. Thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead and call the motion. I have a motion in front of me here to read. Okay. Oh. Perils of doing this. Okay. So I will make the motion. The board finds that a board seat will become vacant effective June 21st, 2024, and agrees to fill the vacancy by appointment and directs the interim general manager to proceed with posting a notice of vacancy with July 1st, 2024 at 3 p.m. as the closing date for the receipt of applications. And in departure from board policy manual guidelines, schedule applicants for interviews at either a special meeting scheduled at the board's convenience at the July 18th meeting or at the latest, the August 1st meeting and may make its appointment at the July 18th meeting or any properly noticed board meeting conducted on or before August 1st, 2024. Do we have a second? Uh, I second. Okay. Hill. Yes. Vice President Ackerman over these issues abstaining. Director Fultz? No. Director Smalley? Yes. And Director Largay? Yes. All right. Motion has passed. Motion has passed. Okay. Moving on a new business. We have Adopt a resolution submitting to the qualified voters of the district regarding the initiative petition. And Mr. Frost, would you please present that? Sure. Can we get CCTV to uh, promote Barbara? She promoted, she's on the screen. Okay. When she starts talking, they'll put her on probably. I see. Okay. Um, Barbara, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good evening. Great, Barbara. So I'm going to have uh, President, I will have um, Barbara present, start the presentation, and then I'll have a few comments at the end. I believe we also have Heather. Heather, are you also available? Uh, maybe yes, not. Okay. I'm here. Okay, so we will have, in case there's questions at the end, we have finance or acting finance manager. And so thank you. Take it away, Barbara. Good evening, board members. As you may recall, last week during the regular board meeting, we had uh, the county clerk come during uh, open session during the comment period for the for the board meeting and present the um, initiative that was presented by Mr. Holloway to the citizens of your district, and had could he had collected. Um, signatures. The county clerk indicated last week that she certified those signatures for this initiative, this this uh, voter initiative to be presented. We have talked to county council about the certification of those signatures and gone through a few things. There's a, and, um, and before you this evening, as a result of that voter initiative process, and where it is at this point, given the number of signatures collected, is now back to the board. And unfortunately, county council and the county office, clerk office, ran into some, well, she was she got sick. The county clerk was out of the office. And so normally we wouldn't have to turn this around so quickly. We would have been given more notice mm -hmm. about the certification of the signatures. So we had to, it's, it seems a little fast, but that's just, what's before us and and what you are doing this evening is exercising your decision that you must exercise given the initiative process of, e of either adopting 
the res adopting the initiative as presented as an ordinance or placing it onto the next regular ballot. So that's the first resolution that you see in the board packet. It's simply to make that determination if you want to adopt it as an ordinance and, and avoid the ballot process, or if you want to place it on the ballot and let the rest of the voters in the district vote on the initiative. The second resolution is basically the process that comes forward after you decide to put it on the ballot. And so the intention of that res resolution is to just set forth the next steps that are taken pursuant to the election code. And Mr. Holloway uh, made some comments about both those resolutions. And the first one is a, a comment that the resolution doesn't duplicate the initiative, the proposed ordinance, word by word. Um, and I took a look at that and I noted that the last section, section seven of the proposed ordinance or the initiative is severability. And the last few words in that sentence in the packet says shall rate remain in full force and effect. Whereas the ordinance, the initiative or ordinance proposed, those last few words say remain fully in effect. So there is a slight change in the words, though they have the same impact. So I would suggest that you use the exact same words used in the proposed initiative and that section seven, the last few words be, be replaced with remain fully in effect. The other resolution change is a little more detailed and involves, let me get to the actual resolution, a couple of paragraphs, a sentences in a couple of paragraphs. And that is found in the second resolution at the first full paragraph primary arguments and as pointed out the sentence starts with the, that the board of directors authorizes and continues from there with uh romanet numbers one through four or one through three no one through four and that portion of that paragraph needs to be replaced the numerant numbers one through four should be deleted and the beginning of the sentence should say, still begin with that the board of directors and then strike authorizes. And as I indicated, Roman numerates one through four. And in place of that state confirms the person's filing the initiative petition may file a written argument in favor of the district measures and then insert as well, and the district board may file an argument against the district measure. And then the paragraph continues, accompanied by the printed names and signatures, et cetera. And the rest of that paragraph is correct. The second paragraph indicates that the arguments for or, or against the district measure should be filed with the district secretary and the county registrar. They only are filed with the county registrar, not the district secretary. Secretary, And that was a mistake made by my office, those two. And so I want to recognize those and, and ask that the resolutions, that resolution be amended, or both be amended to make those couple changes. The process the board follows is what is set forth in the election code. So. This is, this is correcting it to be in compliance with the process that you need to follow. The only, the last thing I'd just like to point out to the board on this particular initiative process is confirmed by case law that this is the process, the initiative process is provided for in Prop 218 or Article 13 of the California Constitution. And what the initiative process can do is what this initiative is attempting to do is decrease a fee or charge passed under Proposition 218. 
there's a couple cases, the Bighorn case that confirms that that's what the initial process can do as set forth in Article 13 of the California Constitution. And the other thing that's kind of interesting that the cases have decided that you can, by the initiative, you can decrease the rates, but you can't decrease the rates to the point where an, a public entity can't function. So the initial process can't lower your rates to the extent you can't function or can't comply with a mandatory law such as the Clean Water Act. The other thing that the initial process doesn't prevent you from doing is adopting a new fee, assuming that the initial process passes in this instance and the one charge or fee is, uh, re is stricken, you can turn around and, and adopt a new fee. And you don't need to go through the initial process to do that. You do the new fee just the same way you did the current uh, fees under the Prop 218 process. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or if, as Brian indicated, he wanted to add some additional information. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, can you go ahead and queue up that slide for me, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to point out a couple things that regardless right now where we are is the $19 million uh, bond issue that we just started last, approved the last meeting to start that off. Um, we now have to look, we look, our preliminary numbers show that we would have insufficient debt service coverage. <laughs> To take on that full 19 million. So we would probably have to split that into two issuances of 12 and $8 million. Um, 12 being the first issuance that we could afford with to keep our debt service ratio. So that amounts to a $200,000 increase in issuance costs. When you look at doing two versus one and the fixed costs, et cetera. So we're looking at right now, Regardless of how we decide, that's already that's already occurred because because this is pending. Whether it goes to the ballot or we swallow it, the bond people that's how they're going to look at us is that we may not have enough, but this is all we can afford. So twelve million dollars, which also then cascades into the other bit is that now we're going to be looking at reprioritizing our capital improvement program, FEMA projects, holding on to grant funds that we have where we have to put in some extra money to keep those grants going, and then having money for urgent projects. Um, so that's gonna become an issue. Um, along with that, tack on some legal fees, um, which we've already incurred. So putting it on the ballot, another 40 to $80,000, as we indicated, um, June 6th, excuse me, it hasn't been, sorry, this is in the staff memo, but. The number of voters times two fifty to four dollars per voter. Counties estimating between forty and eighty thousand. If we elect to put it on the ballot, um, again, the loss in fixed fees the first fiscal year about a million dollars, and so on it goes up. It would be over the life of our rate study or rate period. It would be seven point seven million. Of course. Likely what we do is turn around and go and do another great study, which we could probably leverage the last one we did, maybe another 60,000. We could have another rate study that's volumetric based and it gets us back going again. Also, just to point out that right now what you have is a little over a thousand signatures for almost 18,000 registered voters or 5.7%. Next slide, please. So, I don't know if everybody remembers Monty Hall, <laughs> but you have really two choices here. So there's door number one, door number two. So one would be accept and adopt right now, or two, you place it on the ballot. And if you're placing it on the ballot, what Barbara's prepared, those resolutions, with the correction she just mentioned is basically, you're following a prescriptive process. This is the, this is the roadmap that how you put it on the ballot. 
So passing those two resolutions means you're saying you want to put it on the ballot. So I will open it up to questions. Thank you. Well, I did have one question, um, Barbara, on your statement about, hey, we just turn around and pass a new fee. Um, did you mean that we could pass a new fee the same as the old fee? We just would have to get it a different name? No, you have to pass it with, assuming that this initiative passes, then you've got this extra layer of uh, restriction, right, that you have to comply with. Yeah. But I, th I thought you were saying that you could turn around and and say we could just have a new fee. I'm assuming a new fixed fee. We just would give it a new name? Or did I misunderstand that? No, no, you don't just give it a new name. You, you, the fee that's being repe repealed through this initiative, you can adopt a new version of that fee that complies with this initiative. And that could be a fixed charge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have one yes and one no. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm assuming that, and by no, that's uh, Heather was shaking her head no. Um, I, I want to make sure I understood that because it it sounds to me like what you're saying is that, okay, the voters make their policy choices known. Let's say they pass it. We can turn around and say, well, we don't care. We're going to give you another one anyway. New boss, same as the old boss, just with a new name. Can I yeah, I, that's not how I, that's not, uh, if you me, comply with the, let me be very specific. Let me be very specific. Yeah, what it, yeah. yeah. I'm so not sure we, what you're trying to say here. Yeah, so let's say the, the increase for a person in the fixed charges was ten dollars. Mm -hmm. And that's being and that's being wiped. Let's say this initiative passes, that's being wiped away. Could the district come back and say, we have a a new fee, we're gonna call it fee X, and that is ten dollars. And we go through the Prop 218 process. Could we pass that? No. No, you can't just take the fee that the initiative is is striking and just put a new name on it. Can I clarify? No. I, can I clarify, Jamie? Okay. Uh, as I understand it, Barbara, if the initiative were to pass with a majority vote in November we would be obligated to follow the new rules for rate making that are being proposed through the, the initiative. Correct. And so if we wanted to propose a new rate structure, it would have to comply with the rules that are being proposed by the initiative. Right. And then we would go through a Prop 218 process that complies with the rules proposed by the initiative to determine whether or not we are able to establish a new rate structure. Yes, right. But it would have to comply with the rules voted in in the initiative if the voters approve the initiative yes. in November. Well, that's what I thought. Yes, but I mean, yes. I was clarifying with, based on what Barbara said. It sounded, like the there was some, yeah, it sounded like there might be a little wiggle room there. And I wanted to make sure there's no wiggle room yeah, there, yeah. right? Okay. No, that's, that's what I said in the first instance, that when you, mm -hmm. you can pass a new fee, but you have to comply with the restrictions that are set forth in the initiative, as well as Prop 218 and all the other laws that you have to comply with. Mm -hmm. This is just a new one that's added on. It's a new yeah. restriction to your ability to adopt fees. And that restriction would apply to all fixed fees. And by fixed However fees, you yeah. read that initiative. Yeah. Well, that's that's pretty much what it that's, says. Okay, but so, that's not the question here right now. The we're not right. determining what's in the initiative. We're determining whether or not to adopt it now or to send and, it to. So, well, well, there's a, been a number of things introduced into the conversation yes. that actually go outside of that, and I do want the opportunity to address some of them because I want to make sure I, I want to make sure we're not fear mongering here. But well, just just a moment. Could, could we please have orderly discussion? Yeah, I, I have been I, recognized. I, 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 Point I, of order. I, I have been no, recognized. I have, I have recognized him. But, okay. So, but in the interest of comedy, 
but committee, C-O-M-I-T-Y, yes. if you have something you wish to say, I would yield the floor. Yes. And as long as I can come back at a future time. So please. Or make a comment. Okay. Get it. Get okay. It. So in the interest of transparency, I did sign the petition mm -hmm. um, because I think this is a positive step forward for our district. Um, our general manager brought up the issue around loans. My concern about our approach to loans in the past has been that the process we followed hasn't worked well for us. We take on a huge amount of debt and the projects don't happen for years down the road. There needs to be a different way of doing that. Second of all, I have yet to see a real cash flow uh, statement uh, for the district. I'd asked for one during the rate setting process. We got a very high level sort of hand waving type thing from the consultant, nothing that actually really allowed you to look at what our cash requirements really needed to be at, at a fundamental level. Um, I think this will also give time for the case that is currently in front of um, one of the California appeals courts about the validity of tiered rates, uh, it's PATS or PALS or something like that, to work through the process. I believe that's supposed to go to the appeals court sometime this year and be decided hopefully later this year. Uh, so that process will have worked through as well to confirm whether or not tiered rates are in fact legal under the um, uh, California constitution. Because as of right now, my interpretation is they aren't. Um, this also allows us for the first time ever in this district to actually go to, and this to me is one of the most important things, is to be able to go to the public and rather than having this anti-democratic sort of hide the salami reverse vote, to actually allow the people to vote on their um, uh, finances around the district to have a robust debate around how the district is spending money, what it's spending money on, what our budgets are, and for the district, if it wishes, in its statement, to make the case as to why this needs to be defeated. To me, this is, in fact, the essence of what we should be doing. Unfortunately, Prop 218 sort of flipped it on us so that we can't, but this will allow us to determine whether or not there is serious issues in the community with how the district is doing its finances. Um, and we'll find out one way or the other. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to um, clarify procedure. I thought we were taking questions, but it appears we're taking both comments and questions. So I'll assume that we are not going to do a further round of comments since my fellow director obviously uh, did both. Um, my first question, uh, if we were to be in a position where we were... This woman has not has put herself off the board. She just admitted that. She's no longer going to come. I'm sorry. We don't recognize points of order from the public. And I am on the board until June 21st when my resignation takes effect. But we don't take comments from the public unless you get up and are recognized. So please don't call out. So, two questions. Um, Heather, can you tell me what we would be losing in terms of revenue? Um, so if, if we are assuming that the, if it were to pass and the rates were to be repealed, I'm assuming that would take effect in January? No, it, um, based, on, based on the petition, it would take effect in November. Okay. It would be, I, I believe it said, I wanna say 10 days after the certification of, of the election. And so the numbers that Brian put up were about seven, we'd be losing about 7 million. But that was if, over if no changes, if we choose right. not to go to a Prop 218 and change the structure of the rates, which I would recommend moving to a more volumetric rate, Wait, but hold on. That's not my okay. question. Okay. So what I'm trying to ask is how much would on a monthly basis at the point that the district has to reverse its rate structure, what yeah. would our deficit be? What, or, or I guess, would we be able to cover our operating costs and, you know, what things would have to stop or what, what would be the, the impact to the budget 
on an immediate monthly basis until such a time as the board was able to establish a new rate structure. The uh, um, district would be able to cover its operational costs. What would be impact is, is impacted is the capital improvement program, which that, that is the reason for the last week's meet or uh, earlier meeting in June is that we're running out of funds for capital improvements. So we would be able to cover all of our operational costs. It's the capital improvement program would be impacted. What would happen if we had a winter like we've had the last couple of winters that required substantial emergency repair costs? Um, how would we where how would we okay. handle something like that? We do not have sufficient reserves to cover that. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just thinking about the immediate triage um, of the issue, yeah. you know, that we would we would be, okay. no so, matter what, in a dire situation. Keep in mind that the discussion right now is really about do we accept it you know, or do we have the, the election? Given the fact that you allowed another director to have other comments, I think I feel perfectly entitled to make my comments. Thank you. I, I actually support Jamie in that one. That's fine. Make your comments. But I'm, I'm just reminding everyone that the issue at hand is do we take this to election or do we just... Point, point, of, point of order, though. Yes. Those topics that Jamie and I are talking about were introduced by the general manager. Yes, Therefore, it's fair game. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Everybody should get to speak. Okay. So thank you. Those are all of my questions for the moment. Um, I, uh, manager, first, I have um, had a little trouble following the math on your slide. Uh, laying out the costs, uh, if I understand correctly, simply the filing of this measure uh, will already cost the district some $300,000 in administration fees if it goes to an election and in lost uh, uh, rating or, or um, lost ability to, to um, proceed with the uh, the bond issuance. Is, is that a sure, problem? Um, so right. Director Largi, I'll, I'll explain is what happens is we'd, we'd started the process for a $19 million bond issue. Because of the um, being able to meet that service with, because when the fixed fee gets rolled back, we would not have sufficient funds to cover our debt service. Um, on, nine, on a full 19 million. So we'd have to go to a split, split that up essentially. And so with two issuances, there's about $200,000 um, difference in cost of doing it, everything at once versus two. And that happens regardless of which door you choose tonight is that's already occurred because the bond issue people have already said, we're not gonna be able to loan you the full 19 million now because this is looming. So, and if you recall, there was like $9 million just in FEMA money. Sorry, you wouldn't have recalled this, but there for the rest of the board members, and there was about $9 million in shortfall in just FEMA projects alone, which is about half of that 19 million. So we might, we might be able to drop up. In other words, just keeping the FEMA projects alive and maybe a few million dollars plus is what we would be able to borrow for. Um, and then, yes, and then regardless, we're going to have legal fees, which I've put on there. And then once it goes to the ballot, that's where the forty to $80,000 um, county fee to put it on the ballot. Goes. Right. Does that, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. So 280000 approximately are the costs that the district are, is going to incur if this goes to the ballot. At least, actually... Uh, 320 or so, yeah, yeah, okay, 280 yeah. to 320, yes. 280 to 320, correct. So the 1,000 signatories um, are essentially costing the district approximately $300,000 mm -hmm. through this filing. Yep. Yes. Um, and then if it were to pass or if we were to adopt it tonight, then uh, that would set forward a cascade that would result in district finances being some $7 million in deficit within five years? Correct. And in the first year, 
um, you know, the first fiscal year, a million dollars. Are those deficits cumulative? Um, Wait, or is that total? clarifying of a, of a term here? Yeah, go ahead. Those, the, that, those numbers are reduced revenue. That is not necessarily a deficit. Yeah, thank you. So the reduce, so the district would need to make do with some $7 million in total or uh, $7 million plus all the accumulated sh shortfalls in revenue during the prior years. Well, it's hard to predict all the other, how that would cascade, but $7 million, $7.7 .7 million, so almost $8 million in revenue over five years, I the see. next five years. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, that strikes me as problematic. Okay, thank you. Mark? Mark? Yes. Um, I want to go back to the uh, door number one versus door number two, uh, because I think I'm faced with two options um, as of tonight. Uh, allow this uh, initiative to take effect now or put it on the ballot. Um, what is our monthly reduction in revenue, approximate, uh, if we allow this to take effect tonight? And monthly being, let's say, start August. About. Heather, do you want to take that? Do you have a rough? I'm calculating because I have yes. essentially the difference between if we if we adopt it now, right, versus yes. let's say the ballot measure passes. If, 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 okay? if we let it go right now. Yeah. It's about, it's a difference of we'd start this fiscal year, excuse me, next fiscal year that starts July 1, okay. we would, we would lose approximately 291,000. Wait, 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 per month? No, 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 um, total. So if we go, sorry. Um, that's, that's where I'm trying to get to. No, I, yeah, it, just one second. So, sorry. But I, I do also want to caution about us doing math on the fly versus. I, under, I understand that, yes. Brian. All I'm looking okay. for is an about to try approximately, to. Approximately, an estimated number at approximately 60000 a month. Okay. So, 60000 a month. What, what are we now between now and the election? Five months? Yeah, that's that's how I I took my large number and divided it by five. Three hundred thousand. Yeah, it's approximately three hundred thousand. Approximately, approximately, approximately estimated. Yeah. If, if we if we choose not to put this on the ballot, that's Correct. immediate loss between now and November. Okay. All right. Correct. That answers, answers my question. Thank you. Thank you, director. Comments from the public? The first thing I want to say is, let's see, on the packet, page 143 and 144 uh, shows one section of our petition. And my name is on this petition, and also Deb Lowen is a co-proponent. So she's my equal partner and has been from the start. Um, I was confused. I, I only got to see this packet last night. Um, and I was confused by the ordinance on page 148. Um, at the top of the page, it says attachment two. And it also says attachment two on a few other pages that come before that, which is a lengthy resolution. Um, so I... Last night I was confused, and I, I guess I'm still confused, but it, it kind of appears that attachment two is presenting two different alternatives to the board. So either either go with the three-page resolution or else adopt the ordinance. And these are the two choices. Is that is that correct? Otherwise, I don't understand what this page 148 is. And no one's going to answer me. Um, um, just a moment. We can have, we can have clarifications at the end. Yes, yeah. we need to get some clarification on that. Sure. And uh, I think we should get that from Barbara. Do you want it now or do you want to just wait till the end of comment? Okay. If, 
Finish your comment, um, and then I we'll... I see the clock searching here. Um, you know, you, you have gotten into a lot of issues here about the debt issue and so on. I went to the Finance Committee meeting yesterday. Uh, there was something on the agenda about a $300 fee. And I sort of said to the, to the committee, well, you should really be talking about $19 million, not $300. Mm -hmm. And um, so some of this discussion that's going on right now, I think would have been ideal at the Finance Committee meeting. Um, and, and so I'm a little bit boggled by all the different issues that are, that are coming up here. Um, I want to understand what page 148 is. It's not, it's not the, um, the measure text that we filed with the elections department. And I don't think anyone can change that except a superior court judge. So I don't understand that page. Um, back before the rate increase hearing, I had a letter published in the press banner, and I basically said, uh, don't lower the price of water. That's what the rate restructuring did. It lowered the price of water for most customers. I said, don't do that. Leave the uh, price of water at 1266 where it's been for more than two years. And that will uh, save enough revenue that you can lower the fixed charges. And nobody listened then. And so this initiative was the result. Um, and I would still say that the board could go back to 1266 per unit of water, and that's going to recoup uh, about, about an equal amount. Time. 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 Okay. Thank you. you don't want to hear from me. I think it's absurd, really, that you don't want this is a big topic. And um, we could we could get a little further, but uh, your process doesn't allow it. Point of order, point of order. Yes. You do have the discretion. Yes, I know. And I'm this is I'm, li I'm listening to what he has to say. But but to, to cut him off after three minutes, given he's a proponent of this, seems a little bit short sighted this on isn't our. This is an opportunity for public debate, and it's not a. It's not. It's, it's not a. It's comment. not a debate. It's allowing us to be able to have an exchange of information here, so that we know what we're voting on, and we make sure that it's the right stuff. It's, it's nine thirty, and it's fair to give everyone an opportunity to comment, which we have prescribed described in our board policy manual and everybody should get an equal opportunity to do so equal he had taken up many okay so i think we got a good understanding of mr holloway's objections to the resolutions here um and i think um Continue taking public comment. Just a moment. Uh, now we'll hear from you. Yeah, my name is Mark Lee, by the way. Yes. Mr. President, I'd like to talk to the council. Again, on page 148 is still not exactly the way the text was submitted to the county. It's an error that needs to be corrected. Uh, also, why not just adopt the ordinance now and save us eighty thousand dollars in an election? You're going to save you eighty thousand plus you already blew two hundred thousand dollars by malfeasance in an engineering contract. So we're we're talking peanuts here. We're talking about restricting the, the fixed charge to two percent increases for the next twenty five years. Put the burden on the user who's consuming water. That's the essence of this bill. We're not trying, we're just restructuring. So it's more equitable as the preamble in this board's board, the board policies stipulate. Mm -hmm. Do we understand? You have the choice of adopting the legislation tonight or we see you in the next election. And by the way, we will win because the current structure is so outrageous, it's insane. People are leaving the valley because they can't afford it. So please, I'm asking the questions to County to the to District Council. Please get the legislation corrected before it's adopted tonight. It's incorrect. Page 148 is incorrect. It's in your packet. Please adopt the ordinance, or we go to we go to uh, to a election in November, and we will win. Thank you.
I'm not going to belabor all the technical stuff. Deborah Lowe in Lompico Canyon also is a part of my course. Um, I'd like to point out to the board that from about March till presently, you have approved almost a million dollars in change orders and amended contracts. So just to put in perspective the amount of money we're talking about here. Another perspective is when you change the water rates, you uh, had a loss of about a million dollars a year, every year. You can make that up by simply doing what we're requesting and what the community is requesting is restructuring the way you collect the money by lowering the service charge and putting the money into rates. Your, your business is selling water. So your, your rate structure should reflect that. Um, I had a really wonderful experience collecting these signatures, and as it's been said before, it's, it was a lot of work in the past three or four months, but I've spoken to so many people, and the idea of the sense of fairness is transcends clubs, it transcends all the obstacles, the way we divide ourselves up, it transcends all of that. When we explained what we were doing, people were all for it. There was no objections. The only objections we had were from the usual clubs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I come to board meetings and, and hear about protest ballots being turned in, and they're described by our chief staff as the nut cases turned in, as their usual nut cases turned into protest ballots. Proposition 218 gives us the right to do a protest ballot. What is not explained in any of this information to you tonight is that 218, if you keep reading it, has a special clause for doing an initiative. It is a citizen's initiative to protest the race beyond the, the protest ballot. It has special conditions that make it a lot easier than the normal initiative process because they recognize how difficult it is to get 50% of all registered voters to send in a protest ballot. I think Bruce investigated that years ago and found one, right? Yuba City. Yuba City. A comparable district to our size, it's only been overturned once. And this goes on and on and on. The initiative process is in, hasn't been exercised very often, but right now in Grover Beach, the same thing's going on. They're about a month ahead a month and a half ahead of us, and they will prevail, and we will prevail based on what I've seen. So your idea tonight is you can adopt it now, or you can wait until it becomes adopted later by the vote of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any additional comments from the public? <clears throat> uh, Jim Mosier from Bell. And I want to say that I, I, I come to the podium feeling very sad. The district has just huge challenges to face right now. And we need to be working together. And we're very likely going to have more big challenges hitting us in the next year. Fires, floods, whatever. We need to be working together. Now, we're going to have disagreements. I was on the budget and finance committee, full disclosure. I listened to everybody's position on this. I was spent hours working on it. I understood some of I had a really difficult time uh, uh, understanding the various positions. Uh, the, the consultant working with us had some strong uh, recommendations for us. We had a general manager leave, the finance director leave, uh, because of the contentiousness that we have in the Valley right now. We need to find different ways to work on our disagreements. I think this initiative is absolutely the wrong approach. It's like throwing a hand grenade into the, into the district. And I guess I'm a little surprised. We are a representative democracy. The board members who voted on this, the five, the five who worked on this, are not getting paid. No one's getting rich doing this. The 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 bond, me and others on the budget finance committee, we did the best we could for the valley. We thought this was the best 
we could do. You disagree. So we have an election in November. So in a representative democracy, then you elect the new directors that represent your position. And they could then adopt this initiative in November. We wouldn't have to have another divisive issue on the ballot. I do not agree that this is going to pass. I do not agree that it's just clubs that are opposed to it. <coughs> this is a really serious issue for the district to lose this kind of money right now, to lose the ability to get the funding we need to move forward, to be able to continue with the, the capital improvement projects and to have the money in order to deal with the disasters that are coming forward. I really urge you to withdraw this and to have it be in the election. Let's see, we, we can have we can have an election and this initiative can be the absolute issue that we're facing with two candidates saying I will adopt this and two candidates or however many candidates and saying no, then we're not going to adopt it. We don't think this is the right thing. And the voters will decide we don't need this initiative with an election coming up in six months. Uh, it just makes me sad. I wish we could work together. Um, there was very little public input into this process. I can tell you that because I was there at all the meetings in which there was a, a public uh, opportunity for public to listen to what the consultant was telling us and what the staff was telling us and why we needed to do it the way we did it. Jim, uh, there were yeah. mistakes made. I have no yeah. doubt there were mistakes made. Jim, your, you. your time's up. Thank you. <laughs> Ray Spencer has, has their hand up. Okay, just a moment here. Let me find my Zoom page here. Okay, who has a hand up? Ray Spencer. Ray Spencer. Okay, Ray Spencer, can you? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with the previous speaker. I think we should put this on the ballot and let the people decide. Um, I know there was disagreement about the price increases, and I think that maybe it needs to be revisited more widely. Um, one concern that I personally have is that inflation in 2021 was uh, about 4.7%. In 2022, it was 8%. In 2023, it was 4.1%. And so far this year, I believe it's about 3%. So every year, it's been more than 2%. And I just wonder how the district would be able to address costs and rising costs. Uh, for what it has to do uh, if we are going to cap the price at 2%. Um, and I think that is part of the discussion that uh, voters should get to consider and weigh in on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have anyone else on the public with their hand up? No. No. Have we heard from everyone? Bob, uh, you wish to speak again? I, I have a question. Yes. Are there any other options here other than door number one or door number two? Let's say we did nothing. What would happen? Or is there an opportunity to, in fact, see if there's a, com a compromise that could be reached here uh, by negotiation between now and whenever a final cutoff is? Or, or is door number one and number two the only options? Can I, point of clarification, are we allowed to legally just negotiate out some third rate or would we, I mean, we would have to go through a Prop 218 process if through negotiation with this group, we arrived at some other conclusion about the rates. Is that accurate, Barbara? I mean, yeah, you can, you can, um, you can negotiate something as suggested, but in order to adopt those rates it, 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 or whatever you negotiated, you would, if you, I would have to know what it is, right? It likely would take a 218 process and hopefully would be supported by the rate study that you've already done. So any rate that you adopt under the Constitution, Prop 218, has to comply. You have to have a rate study to support that rate. And, so and that would, and, and then of course you have to do the 218 process again, the hearing, et cetera. So, and we would have to negotiate that by August 9th, was it? Was it? I'm sorry, well, what was the date? They can. Yeah, there's a, there's a yeah, yeah. There's a time frame upon which the the proponents of the initiative can withdraw the the initiative. 
I, I, Jim, I'm only asking because Jim made a fairly impassioned plea to try to work together. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, maybe there is a way to do that. I don't know. But I'm just asking the question, is door number one and door number two the only doors, or do we have three and four? Do nothing, negotiate something. I understand what you're asking. I just wanted to understand legally if yeah. what you were asking. Well, no, if, 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 if you negotiated something, I assumed it would have to go Prop 218. Yes, yes. of course. And that would be under, under a level of trust that, hey, we've got a deal here and nothing's going to you know, mess with it. So You don't have the option to do nothing. You, you need to make a decision whether to adopt the ordinance or put it on the ballot. Okay. Yeah. So door, three doors, the real, <laughs> let's make a deal. Door number one, door number two, door number three. Okay. I only heard two doors. Yeah. Well, she said you could, in fact, do something. What's the last day to withdraw this? Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to. I, I saw it today, but I can't. I would have to go back to the election code. Does anyone? Does, can anyone from the audience just say what that date is if they know? Okay. Okay. Sometime in August. So we do have a few days, month. Barbara, can, can I just clarify this? I don't, Thank I you. I wanna, can I just clarify? We have to make this decision in 10 days. 10 days falls on Sunday, so we pretty much have to make this decision tonight because we wouldn't be able to schedule another meeting. So it's door number one or door number two, correct? Yeah, for tonight, you have to make that decision. What you, you can do between now and the election is a whole different ballgame. Exactly. Okay. Yes. That's why so I want to make that decision decisions. tonight. And only two decisions. Yes. Two decisions only. Tonight. Tonight. Two decisions. One decision. Put it on the ballot or not. Or not. Right. Thank you. Okay. And Bob, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to answer your question. It does yes. say the county uh, clerk said the measure can be removed by the proponents up to August 9th. Okay. So we take action tonight. Mm -hmm. And then, if we're really serious, if we, we talk. want, yeah, we talk. I mean, I'm all for making a deal if it's possible to do that. That's worthwhile talking. Talking is always good. That's assuming the proponents would be willing to engage in what Mr. Mosher was suggesting, working together. Neither party may get everything that they wanted, but, um, you know, let's, let's make the deal. Okay, so for tonight, we still have to decide door number one or door number two. I understand. And the uh, motions and descriptions that I have in front of me have been changed substantially by Barbara in a couple of areas. And so I would like to propose that we simply vote to either go to the election or not, and then have legal counsel follow up with the appropriate paperwork i don't think we can do that can we? i think we need to vote on the resolution haven't we uh, asked council because that's yeah. what they're there for barbara can you read the motion is that perfectly okay to read the motion well i, I i'm not going to read the entire resolution that's for sure no no the motion no, the said. motion uh, well the no. motion is before you i believe like, I mean, so the motion doesn't change regardless of the changes you made, correct? No, the motion's the same. The change is that the only thing that I would like to clarify, let me clarify something. The, the change in the second resolution with regard to the process is simply to comply with the applicable law. It doesn't, it doesn't change your vote whatsoever. It just makes it clear what, what process <laughs> you're going to follow assuming you elect to put it on the ballot. The first resolution where there's some apparent discrepancy between the initiative language and what is set forth in the board packet as the ordinance, I only found the couple words, as I indicated earlier, in section seven at the end of that sentence to be inconsistent and i'm not aware of any other inconsistency between page 
The ordinance is set forth in page on page 148, and the initiative that's set forth at page 144. Yes, there it is. Okay. I, I'd like you to tell me what those are, please. What other discrepancy do you see? It doesn't start on page 144. What? The measure text starts on page 143. Oh, the whereas clauses? Yes. That's not the ordinance. The, the, the effective, the operative language of the ordinance is what the measure text is. The title shall be seen fixed, thus shall be known as the fixed charge. That's your ordinance. That's what the board adopts. It doesn't adopt your whereas. May I speak? Yes, please. It would be really simple by this for council to just adopt the initiative measure as presented to uh, the elections. It does include the whereas. It's, there is also another discrepancy in line one under titles, which has been changed there. It would really simplify it to just drop whatever is in the board packet and replace it with the initiative measure that was presented to the county clerk in its entirety and accepted. I mean, we can go over and parse word by word. Obviously, someone is not proofread all of it to make sure that it was exactly what was submitted. So we submitted an initiative measure to elections department, and I believe mm -hmm. that should be what is reflected. Yes, the that's the, that's the official accepted. document at the moment. Sorry? That's the official document. Yes, but it's not what's in your board packet. It's not in your board packet. Yeah. <laughs> so far to clarify, if they read the motion as written, the recommended motion, then this is passed. Is that correct? Right. Thank you. Okay, so, you so read the recommended motion as is. The small changes will be noted. Um, okay, so be noted in the minutes. Just a moment here. Are you talking about all of page 145? Just a moment. What are you? I can make a motion, Jeff. Okay, Mark, would you make the motion? I'll make the motion that the board um, adopts the resolution submitting to the qualified voters of the district a citizen's initiative measure repealing certain fixed rates for water service and limiting future increases to certain fixed rate charges and to adopt a resolution providing for the filing of primary and rebuttal arguments and setting the rules for the filing of written arguments regarding the citizen initiative measure to be submitted to the district's registered voters at the December 5th, 2024 district general election. November. Friendly, friendly amendment, November. November. I'm sorry, November. November. Yes, thank you. Yes, you have a comment. Uh, we don't take comments. Before oh, sure this becomes a, official <laughs> district documents, also included in both the introduction and in the resolution that says that it requires 10% as an initiative, and that is to be correct. This is a Prop 218 initiative. 5%. Pardon? 5%. To 5%, correct. Okay, Mr. Holloway. Thanks. Um, the resolution you're talking about refers to some sections in the elections code that pertain to municipal elections, not district elections. So I think the resolution was drafted in a slapdash manner. Um, Anything in the 9200 range is, is for a municipal election. Uh, the law for district elections is in the 9300 range. So section 
9223 should really be 9312, and section 9295 should really be 9380. So the recommended motion does not mention any sections. Kind of well, point, point of order. I would like to have in front of me the final language. I know that this is too Sunday, but can we take maybe um, a five or 10 minute recess to allow Barbara to make the corrections to email to us to at least so that we see what it is that we're voting on? Um, is that possible? I don't there's know. Been a, there's been a lot of changes here, yes, and I am, I, I am I, not I, following I, all I, of them. That, that's I, like you. I'm not sure exactly what I'm looking at here. Because even though the motion says something that doesn't refer to it, we're actually voting on a resolution. I like to know that the language we're voting on, the resolution, what that language is. And right now, I can't tell you what that is. If it was one change, I'd say, eh, no big deal. But we've had a lot so of this changes. This around. Chair and dis disagreements. If, yes. if I can make a, a comment, I believe that the uh, that council has identified very minor. I agree. Provisions to the to the measure, and I would like to second the motion that you put forward. Okay. And request that we Present. proceed. And just, uh, just one moment. Um, point of order. Just one moment. Uh, you don't get order. to call you point of order. No, point of order is not. For, it's, it's for the board members, not for the public. Just one moment. So the motion that I read does not contain all of the detail of the resolutions. It merely states that we will um, file a resolution uh, with the... Um, district uh, with the county uh, election uh, department. Um, now, yes, please. Mark Lieberman. Again, I'm calling on the district council to provide us a definitive ordinance or resolution that we presented to the district, uh, to the county elections department. In total, it has to be in one body. You can't, the ordinance as it is written is incorrect. There are all kinds of errors. In it. We would be adopting an ordinance without all the corrections. We need to take a break and let her develop and fine tune the language so we, are, we know exactly what we're voting on tonight. Please take the time. You're not, this is County Council, you're not adopting any ordinance tonight. We're adopting a resolution. We're, we're just yeah, there's no ordinance being adopted. That ordinance is not being adopted tonight. We're talking about resolution. Please, sir, you are not allowed please. to get up and speak whenever you want. Please get out of our county. <laughs> please sit you down. You need to leave please this board down. meeting. You are completely out of line. You are being inappropriate, and you do not come in here and speak to the board that way. There are there are practices. You are not entitled to get up and speak whenever you want. And if you do it again, we will call the police and we will have you removed. Point of order, I did allow him to speak. But if he jumps up again without permission, I will ask him to leave. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. So, Barbara, you were speaking before we had this outburst. Well, there was some indication that an ordinance was being adopted. There's no ordinance being adopted. You're electing to go to the ballot with this initiative or not. The process set forth in the, in the resolution, assuming you go to ballot, is one that's set out in the election code. It's, it's prescriptive, as indicated earlier. You have to follow the rules. So that's all that the resolution's doing. If the, if the citations to the election code on the process are not the right code sections, you still have to follow the correct process. No matter what you adopt, you're obligated to follow the right process. It's prescribed for you. So. May, may I suggest something? 
because right now I, I get we're not adopting an ordinance. I didn't say ordinance, I said resolution. We are adopting a resolution. That resolution language needs to be what it is we're adopting. It is not currently in this document what it is that we should be adopting. There are errors in it. So should we take, th this would be the this resolution. Okay, so that is not Here. what I, that is not the motion that I, that's a. This is the resolution. The motion is saying we're adopting the resolution. The resolution is a three page document. Yes. That has language in it. Yes. That is, reflects what it is that we're voting on. Yes, and it is complex and, and apparently has changes. Can we go through the changes again? And if Barbara needs a few minutes to do that, can we do that to make sure that we're really clear about what it is we're voting on? Because what I'm afraid of here is voting on something with incorrect information, and then somehow there's an unexpected consequence to that. I don't know what it could possibly be, but I don't want to have any. If we take a few minutes to do it right. Oh, um, May I make so, a comment? Yes, please. Thank you. I, I have high confidence in our council to guide us through this process. And if in council's opinion, it is reasonable to vote on this resolution and proceed, I encourage us to do so. Time is of the essence. Yes. We need to move forward. And there's, uh, to my understanding, no substantial changes compared to what's in the, in the packet. And in fact, the, the resolution simply directs the registration of this measure to the Elections Commission. And of, of course, it has to be consistent with the petition. Yes. Uh, I mean, so I, I, I again would request that we proceed with the vote. Okay. So, Ooh. District Council, you had a quick, you had a comment. Uh, I'm, I was just going to indicate if you want to take a 10 minute break. And, and create a red line. I will have to work with district secretary or the clerk, whatever, whichever name you want to provide for Jennifer um, on a word version of this document. I don't have a word version of this document sitting in front of me and create a red line. Um, I am also tired. It's 10 o'clock at night. Um, I, I, I would like to know and, and vote upon by the board before we do that, whether you're going to elect to put this on the ballot or not, because I'm gonna, this is a waste of time if you're not gonna elect to put it on the ballot. I think that's why it's going. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, so I will withdraw my prior motion and I will instead move that the district notify the Excuse me? No, Mark made the motion. I oh. made the motion. Oh, you're done. You can't withdraw it. Mark would have to. Oh. Yes, Mark. Um, Do you want to withdraw the motion? I, I, I agree with what Brian Largue said. <laughs> I trust our council at this point. We have a motion in front of us. If the majority of the board doesn't wish to proceed with that, then we'll do something else. But we have a motion and a second in front of us. So, but. Mark, my, my issue isn't the, uh, the, the motion. The, the issue is the underlying uh, resolution language. Right. So if, 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 if council can guarantee that there are absolutely no downsides to voting on a resolution that is incorrect citations or other incorrect information, then we can proceed. In my, under my understanding is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Director Smalley, that the motion is with corrections, correct? That is correct. You pointed out corrections to us before. I'm willing to accept those and feel that you are prepared to incorporate those. Yes, 
and I'm very comfortable with that then. Great. Uh, clarification, does that include the corrections that came from the audience as well, Barbara? Assuming they provide them to her and, and make it clear what they are. Yeah, I, what I heard was she was asking and she was not getting full information, so it'd probably be good to provide that. Yes. Yeah, I think I, I think I understand all the corrections requested. They want the whereas clause within the ordinance provision and all the whereas clauses, as well as some corrections in what I'll call the process res of. As to the uh, ones that I mentioned, as well as uh, election code references. And the percentage. Right. Okay, great. Okay. Can we reread the motion that is on the floor? Certainly. Um, I believe that I read it already. I think it's up to the district secretary at this point. Yes. We've already motioned in seconds, so let's go. I believe we wanted it reread or not. Would you, would you please reread it so that we are clear on exactly what we're voting? Sure. Mark, Mark or, yeah. I can. Sorry, can you reread it? Please. Sure. Please. The board adopts a resolution submitting to the qualified voters of the district a citizen initiative measure repealing certain fixed rates for water service and limiting future increases to certain fixed water service charges and two adopts a resolution providing for the filing of primary and rebuttal arguments and setting the rules for the filing of written arguments regarding citizen initiative measures to be submitted to the district's registered voters at the November 5th, 2024 district general election with corrections as noted by our district council. Thank you. So that has been moved. That has been seconded. Would the secretary please call the roll? President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Director Foles? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. And Director Largan? Yes. Motion unanimous, unanimously passes. Thank you. I believe that is the last item on the agenda. No, we've got one consent consent item. One. I'm sorry. You have one item on consent. On consent. Yes, we do. We have the five mile pipeline hazard tree inventory services agreement on consent. Um, I will move the consent agenda. I will second. Thank you. Okay. President Neal. Yes. Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smalling? Yes. Director Logan? Yes. All right. Thank you. Motion passed. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Good evening. Have a good evening. The rest of what's left. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara.